cells, uh, six of the Sorry, ma'am. Sorry, sir. The sister has disconnected. We will be joining them. Okay, okay, we just discontinue, sir. Please continue, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, but you see, I disconnected. Okay, so today is the session six of the webinar series of crypto, uh, cryptography, network security, and cyber security. It is jointly organized with the uh, Islamic University of Science and Technology. And uh, we are happy that uh, we are having the three invited speakers today. Dr. Uh, Oi Kong Lee, Gaetron University, South Korea, Dr. David Galindo, University of uh, Birmingham, UK, and Dr. Alice Mary, UK, Leuven, uh, Belgium. So now we are uh, with thanks to the all participants. And uh, you see, today uh, uh, we are having the three, uh, three invited speakers. So uh, due to the some uh, uh, problem, Dr. David will join sometimes later, and he will give the presentation. So uh, due to some busy schedule, he will join sometimes later. So now today is our first speaker, uh, Dr. Y. Kong Lee. Lee received his B engineering in electronics and MSc degree from Multimedia University in 2020, uh, 2006 and 2019, respectively. In between 2009 and 2012, he served as research and development engineering in several multinational companies in Malaysia. Then, PhD degree in engineering from University of uh, Tunku Abdul Rahman in uh, Malaysia in 2018 where he served as an assistant professor. He was a visiting scholar to Charlton University in 2017, Ming Chai University, Taiwan, in 2016 and 18, OTH from Germany. He served uh, several uh, international journals, uh, the reviewers of the several, several international journals and transactions. Now, he will speak today. Uh, uh, Turing a GPU into a supercomputer. Now, uh, I also request to uh, Dr. Lee, you can uh, just uh, give the few words to, uh, words to the audience. Okay. okay. Can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction from Dr. Giri, and please thanks for everyone. Sir, sir. Please reshare the screen, sir. Reshare the screen, okay. I'm sorry, I'm trying.
yes sir it is coming sir it is uh, started yes sir please in full screen yes sir yes sir it is visible please sir continue thanks everyone for attending this talk um today i'm going to introduce uh, how to use a gpu so that you can turn it into a supercomputer okay so uh, just now dr giri already gave a simple introduction of myself i'm actually from malaysia but i now i'm working in south korea so this is my educational background i just obtained my phd in 2018 two years ago so now i'm doing my postdoctoral in research uh, in south korea so a brief introduction on my working experience i actually work in a few companies uh, they are multinational companies in malaysia so my main job is actually on r and d engineer mainly um, i do the firmware programming for example for set top box um, that we use to play movies stream videos and i also work in the Agilent Technologies, now it is known as Keysight. So mainly I program the handheld oscilloscope. So I deal with the Windows CE, Linux, embedded Linux programming. And I make up my mind to start my PhD. So I joined University Tunku Abdul Rahman in 2012 as a lecturer. So I actually teach for a few years while I'm doing my PhD as a part-time. Then in between these few years, I also visited a few universities. For example, I visited East Germany, Germany uh, universities very often from 2015, 18, and 19. So I also deliver some short courses over there. And I visited Taiwan, Kungchia University 2016, and also Canada, Carlton University uh, for research purposes. So currently, I'm working in Gachon University in South Korea. It is near to the Seoul, the capital of South Korea. So this is the uh, bird eye view of this university, a beautiful campus. It's not big, but it's quite beautiful. So this is uh, some beautiful pictures that I took during the spring in this university. Okay, so my main research topic will be on the GPU how to use the GPU. But my research interests are actually on the cryptography. So I implemented many cryptography algorithms into GPU. And also I supervise some students who do the hardware design on FPGA. Currently, especially currently, we are working on the post-quantum cryptography because um, as many of us are aware, the quantum computer is going to be commercialized in maybe 10 or 20 years, we will have that as uh, as popular as the normal PC. So all these existing block cipher hash function, they are not affected, but the public key like public key cryptography like RSA, ECC, they will be broken soon. So many mathematicians and also cryptographer are deriving new cryptography algorithms. So our job is to implement them efficiently. Then I also work on some projects not related to cryptography, for example, numerical solver, sparse, for the sparse numerical solver for circuit simulation, and also indoor positioning system. Okay, so I will start with a brief introduction on what is the difference between a normal CPU and the GPU. So, we always use the CPU to perform tasks, okay, the daily computing tasks. So we are familiar with it. Whenever we say multi-core, like quad-core, um, now even you have six-core, 12 cores, it is being common to the users like us. But uh, GPU actually has a many more uh, cores compared to the CPU. For example, this is uh, Norm, uh, a normal uh, a mid range GPU, okay, not a very high end. It consists of a few thousands of cores. Okay. For example, RTX, this is the latest one, consumer grade GPU. Inside the GPU, there's actually 2,944 cores. Okay. Then each of the GPU actually has a few thousand cores, but they are grouped into a what we call a streaming multiprocessor. 
SP, streaming, SM, sorry, streaming multiprocessor. So you can see that there's a group of processors over here. Inside the SM, you have many small cores, a few thousands of cores. So each of the SM will have about 64, 128 or 192, depends on their generation. So these small cores are GPU cores. Then uh, now you roughly have some idea. The GPU actually has many cores and it is being packaged into the what we call a streaming multiprocessors. If we look at the more high-end GPU, A that A100, this is just released a few months ago. It is used for deep learning. We actually have 8,000 cores. Okay? So it is a very powerful processor. So uh, if, you dig, if you do a search in the internet, you will find that there are many languages to be used for programming GPU. The most, I would say the mo one of the most popular is CUDA. Okay? CUDA stands for Compute United Unified Compute Unified Device Architecture. It is actually introduced in 2006 so that the normal uh, programmer can use the GPU for general computing. Before 2006, um, this is what we call a pre-CUDA era. We have to use something we call shader language uh, to program the GPU. This is actually a language similar to C programming, but they are actually uh, used for 3D graphics. Um, if it, you work in the graphics domain, you will understand that we, they use it very frequently because the GPU actually is the graphic processor. It's used to program the graphics. Then you can also use the GPU by OpenGL, but these are very difficult for general computing. Like uh, if you want to do some search and sort algorithm, you can be hardly able to use this graphics programming to do it. So that's why NVIDIA come up with this CUDA. So this is enabling, this is to enable the users to program in the common high level language like C or C++. And they also support Fortran, although it is very old because you can use Fortran for scientific computing. <clears throat> Currently, there are two leading leaders in the GPU computing world, AMD and NVIDIA. So AMD has their own uh, programming language compared to CUDA. So NVIDIA is using CUDA. And they, there is also another one called OpenCL. You can use OpenCL to program any multiprocessor. For example, your Intel processor, uh, GPU, or AMD GPU as well. But OpenCL is, uh, is not very optimized compared to CUDA because CUDA is released by NVIDIA. To give you a flavor, uh, a normal C code looks like this. So if you parallelize into the GPU, it is more or less the same. It's still a C code. It's just that the accessing of the, the data patterns will become parallel. Okay, so um, let's look at the architecture inside the CUDA programming. Okay the programming model. We have a uh, hardware over here, the GPU hardware. So this hardware is organized. When you write a program, it is organized in three levels, grid, block, and thread. Okay. So when we write a program, we use the same program to run on different threads. They, in the CUDA terminology, we call it a SIMT, single instruction, multiple thread. So this is very similar to the conventional parallel programming model, single instruction, multiple data. Actually, they are very similar. The only difference is that this thread can access multiple data instead of only one data. Okay. Sometimes they do something more than the data. That's why they call it uh, SIMT instead of SIMD. So take an example here. Um, the three levels, the relationship between these three levels is a block consists of many small threads and 
many blocks group together become a grid okay so the maximum number of threads inside a block is actually 1024 but we can actually uh, control the number of threads inside a block so you can set it to 512 32 any numbers as long as it is not exceeding this maximum number so multiple blocks will form a grid some of the GPU has two grids, that means two GPU devices inside one card. But most of the time you will see one GPU card come with one grid. So this is actually a software view of the actual GPU hardware. So when we write program, we usually use this model and the program run in the actual GPU, there will be a slightly different organization in the hardware. But from the software programmer point of view, this is what we are going to look at, look at. Inside the GPU, there are actually many levels of uh, memories. Uh, we can roughly group them into a fast and slow memory. So the fastest memory is actually the register. It is very small, only 64K word. The one word is 32 bit. So if you want to use the GPU register, it is very fast, but very limited. And another limitation is that the register is actually local to the uh, thread. So if the other threads, for example, this thread wants to access the other registers, you cannot do that. So it is only local to one thread. Okay? If this thread is using these registers, it is local to him. Then we have another type of fast memory we call shared memory. Shared memory is actually a, a, what we call a cache, but this is a user managed cache. That means the user can manage the cache explicitly and uh, it is very different from the normal, our normal understanding about the cache. But this cache is also limited in size. Some of the chip, some of the GPU chip, they only have uh, 64K some have 96K. So this is actually very, very useful because you can use this shared memory to share data within a block. For example, just now we have the registers. Let's say this thread 01 want to access the registers in thread 00, it's not possible. Then if you want to do a co cooperative computation, you need to share data between these two threads. Okay? So what we can do, we need to share through the share memory. That's why the name share memory. However, this share memory is limited within the block 00. So if I want to access the exchange the value with another block, then I cannot use share memory. I need to use the global memory. Okay. So, uh, Global memory is actually the VRAM. So this is a slow memory and it is very large in size. By slow, I mean that it is almost 100 to 200 times slower compared to the register. It is, uh, I can say it's very hopeless. It's very, very slow compared to register. However, this is something very important because the size is big. If you, can, if you need to compute a lot of data, you need to use the global memory. Although it is slow, but we still cannot avoid using it. Then we have the constant memory and texture memory. These two are the actually the same piece of hardware, which is the DRAM, but they are actually being cached. And they, these are the read-only memory. We usually use to store some pre-computed values that we want to access very frequently. Uh, okay, a simple view of how the GPU program looks like is they always need to go through these three steps. The first step is I have data in CPU. I will need to copy to a GPU. This is essentially copying the data from CPU DRAM into GPU DRAM. Okay. 
So this is normally done through the PCIe connection. So PCIe also have the tra data transfer limitation. So it could be a bottleneck. Then after, com after transferring the data, what we do is we start the GPU code. Okay. So this is the hardware scheduler. They will schedule the GPU threads to start computing. So when you do computation, you will read data from the DRAM, right? So you will access the data, do computation. After the computation is completed, we will copy this data back to the CPU memory. Okay, this is a process that we follow from first step, copy data, second, computation, and then third, we copy back. Okay, this is a very high level view of how the GPU programs look like. Okay, so just now I mentioned that um, this copying process could be slow. Okay, so we usually don't do the copying very often. We try to minimize the data copy between CPU and GPU as much as possible so that the performance is being preserved. If you copy too often back and forth, then the performance will be very, very slow. Okay. Um, now I'm going to share with you some techniques we use to actually um, optimize the speed of the program in GPU in order to make it a supercomputer. Okay. Uh, the first thing is we need to ma maximize the throughput for global memory access because as I mentioned before, the global memory is a very slow memory compared to other memories inside the GPU because it is actually a DRAM. Then for your, in order to let your program in GPU runs as fast as possible, the first thing is to optimize the global memory. Then global memory has a special properties. It is actually a DRAM. Then in DRAM, we have something we call a burst mode. So you can do a burst read or burst write. So this burst read or uh, burst write actually means that the DRAM will read many bytes to, at one time. So for example, uh, either 32 bytes or 128 bytes. This is actually based on what kind of cache you are using. So no matter how, the uh, DRAM will not read only single byte. They will read many bytes at one time. In order to optimize the speed of global memory, we need to read in this similar fashion. Okay. All of the global memory reading will go through the L2 cache, level two cache. As you can see from this diagram, it will first cache by this L2 cache. If you're accessing the similar data very frequently, then the L2 cache can help you to speed up. Then we have another level one cache over here. Hopefully it can help to uh, boost the performance further. Okay, let's say if I'm using both L1 and L2 cache, then my DRAM read has to be 128 bytes per transaction. If I'm just using L2, then my DRAM read will be 32 bytes, okay? the global memory read. So how can I optimize the performance? Is I need to make sure that I read all the data I need in one time. Okay? As I mentioned, this is the magic number, 128 bytes. So I need to make sure that I need, I organize the data in a way that 128 bytes can be read in one cycle. So I don't have to repeat reading, repeatedly reading many different bytes. Okay, okay let me uh, give an example. We want to, when we want to optimize the global memory read, we have to make sure two properties. First one is we need to have the 
we need to make sure the address of what we are going to read is actually a multiple of either 32 bytes or 128 bytes. So in the normal case, we will enable L1 and L2 cache. So we follow 128 bytes. So we need to make sure that the address, starting address of what we are going to read is actually a multiple of 128 bytes. If we do a misaligned loading, then the performance will be degraded. I will show you example later. The next property is that we need to make sure the colorless memory access. By colorless memory access, I mean you need to organize the data that you are going to read next to each other. So they are in a contiguous chunk of memory. So we do not want to read the data at different memory locations. That is what I mean. So by following these two properties, we can ensure a good global memory read and optimize performance. For example here, this is the best situation because we can see that thread zero is reading this data at an aligned memory 128. So this memory stop at 256 exactly 128 bytes okay then you can see that every byte it sorry at each thread is reading the location next to each other that means they read 128 bytes and they consume all of the data completely so there's no waste in this case this is the best case so you we can actually make sure that all the data that we read are 100% being processed. So this is the best case. Another case which is not so good is that I'm reading data outside of the um, con contiguous location. So the previous slide you can see here, all of them reading next to each other. But this one, you can see thread zero is reading somewhere else. And then here, thread 27 are reading somewhere else, thread 31 somewhere else. Okay, then in between, of course, this is good. But if you observe this, you will know that I need to read three times, okay, because the first time is here. The first time is from address 0 to 1 to 8, okay, I read one time. Because the DRAM is reading 128 bytes, he doesn't care how much you consume, okay? But he will read 128 bytes. First read will be consumed by thread zero and thread one. Then the next read will be consumed by here. Okay, the green color here. And the third read will be from 256 onwards. So we have to read three times in order to com completely consume the data. So this is not a good practice. We have to avoid this one. Okay, this is to actually uh, a more clearer picture with all the addresses here. So in uh, one, one WAP 32 threads, we actually read all the data here and consume. Okay, this is the best. Because we consume all the data that we read, we call this utilization but 100%, uh, okay? There's no data wasted. This case is also good, although it is not polar. You can see that all the threads are reading different location of the memory. They are not next to each other. But the good thing is we consume all the data that we read, 128 bytes. So this is still considered a good case with 100% utilization. So let's go back to uh, this slide. If I need to read three times, okay, then it is only 33% uh, of utilization because the first time I don't utilize, I don't fully utilize the data. I only take, take two of them. And then I take two of them here and the rest from the middle read. I read three times, but actually I only consume 33% of them. The rest I just discard. So that is not a optimized 
solution. This is about the global memory. Then I move on to another type of memory we call shared memory. This is important because most of the time we need to cache some important data. For example, the pre-computed data we can cache over here. And sometimes we need to exchange data between different threads. So this shared memory is designed in a very special way. It is uh, different from the normal memory in the sense that they are organized in a 32 bands. Okay. There is a reason behind this. Uh, NVIDIA designed the GPU architecture to be, uh, or to be executed in 32 threads uh, unit, they call it a WAP. So these 32 threads will always execute the same instruction. So for this case, if I want to read the share memory, I will have 32 threads running in parallel. That's why we have 32 banks of share memory. Inside each bank, you have many locations. So for example, if I have an array, I will need to store here 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 until 31. If I have more data, it will go back to the bank zero. Okay, this will be a rotation until all the memory is filled. So if you have a large array, they will be organized in this way, different banks. What is the best case? The best case is, the most optimized case is that there is no bank conflicts. So that means if I have this thread 0 to thread 31, I'm reading to the memory location in share memory, which is all different, okay? different banks. Then there is no conflict. Everyone happily read the data in a parallel fashion. Okay? So you can imagine this as a normal C. If I do a C, C program, I declare an array 64, it will be stored like this okay? in different banks. So this is a second case, which is also good. The access is not contiguous, but they did not conflict to each other. All of the threads are reading different, uh, different banks. Okay, this is good. Because of this reason, there is no conflict and the uh, shared memory reading is optimized. So every thread can read the shared memory data in only one cycle. Is, which is very fast. However, there's another case. Let's say you did not store it in the right way. Your data can be occurred in such a situation. There's one thread accessing this bank, bank one. Another thread also access the bank one. And third thread also access the bank one. Okay. But the rest doesn't matter. They are in <coughs> accessing the other thread. So accessing the other bank. So in this case, we have three threads coming together. They are accessing the same bank one, and we have a conflict. Okay, so this is what we call a bank conflict. We, we need to uh, try to store the data in a way that they will not be accessed in this situation. Okay. Well, you may ask me what happens if this, have, this uh, is the situation. So the problem here is that the first thread comes in, okay, this one, it will read first. The second thread who comes, they will have to wait. Then the rest of them have to wait. In the end, it's not a parallel accessing, it's actually a serial. So the bottleneck here becomes the bank conflict, okay, share memory access. So next, we already discussed the global memory, the slow memory, then the cache, share memory, what about the registers? Okay. So if I want to exchange data between the threads, uh, it is now become possible because the, 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 the new GPU allows this to happen, but it's only within the, what well, that means only within the 32 threads, but within the 32 threads here. So if we have another 32 threads, they also can exchange data. So what happened is, you need to use a special instruction called WAP shuffle. And it can be used to replace the share memory to do data exchange. And at the same time, you don't have to worry about the bank conflict 
because it is fast. Okay. But uh, the problem is that it is only exchanging data within the 32 threads. If you go beyond the 32 threads, um, you still need to use shared memory. So these are the limitations we need to consider when we write program to optimize the GPU code. And this is a very a more detailed examples. I hope you, I won't scare you away. Uh, the reason I want to ex explain this is uh, I will use this technique in the presentation later that I show you how we can use this to uh, speed up the computation of hash function. In, when we want to use the warp shuffle, there are a few versions. I choose the simplest version. This is a command where you specify the variable you want to read and which, uh, which thread that you want to read. And this is the, the mask. Okay. So for example, I, this, I use this instruction. It means that I want to read the variable name with X from thread three and stop at thread 16, okay? So if you read, you, you look at this figure, for thread zero to thread 15, they will all read the variable X from this thread three. But the 16 onwards to 31, they will read from thread 19, okay? This is actually, uh, a mask that you can specify where you want the module, uh, what, where you want the, the accessing pattern to happen. Okay. So this is actually 16 plus three because we say thread three here, 16 plus three. If I specify 32 here, then all the threads will just read from thread three, okay? So, this is the one of the instruction to use Wap Shuffle. Okay, uh, the, uh, the presentation before this is more on the technical side of how to optimize the performance of GPU. Now I'm go going to share with you some interesting applications. I think uh, GPU becomes very popular due to two reasons. The first is, of course, deep learning. Many people are using it to train the neural network. But uh, recently, it becomes popular not only for deep learning, but also for Bitcoin. Okay? Uh, but I will tell you, Bitcoin, you cannot mine with the GPU anymore. You need a special hardware. So GPU is used to mine Bitcoin maybe in 2013, 2012. Now, you cannot do it anymore. Uh, but there are many people use it for mining the, the other cryptocurrency, the new cryptocurrency. Then in cryptography, we can also use the GPU to accelerate uh, TLS protocol, transaction layer security. Uh, this is widely used to, to do a secure computing, for example, HTTPS. When you want to log into a secure website, you need to use TLS protocol. And there are also people use this GPU to do cryptanalysis, attacking the uh, crypto algorithm. For example, I want to recover the password. I can actually implement it into GPU to crack the password. It's possible. And there are also people use the GPU. Actually, it's very common to do compute, scientific computing. For example, matrix computation, solver, linear solver, finite difference and many more. I myself use it for circuit simulation. So it's becoming very popular now. The next two case studies, I'm going to focus on how to use the GPU to accelerate the cryptography algorithm, which is my main research topics, my main research interest. <clears throat> the first one is about the AES, is an encryption scheme. AES is standardized in, 2000, in 2001 as the encryption scheme, block cipher. It is widely used to uh, encrypt data. Okay. So one of the mode, actually we have five modes to operate. Actually there are more, uh, but these five are more common. 
uh, these modes can be used to encrypt data using the block cipher. However, only ECB mode and the counter mode, okay, ECB and CTR, these two modes can be parallelized because there is no data dependency between each block. Other blocks, they need to, they are data dependency. So you cannot do a parallel computation. For ECB mode, it is not safe because the key is the same, okay? That's why the only way we can implement this AES in GPU is to use the counter mode. So you can see uh, the counter mode does not encrypt the data, it encrypts the counter values. So every counter, every counter values will be encrypted in a parallel fashion. Then in the end, we X all with the plain text to generate the ciphertext. This is why we can do a parallel computation. Okay, this is just a very brief introduction. Okay, I know many of us already know about AES. So what I want to point out is that all these operations can actually be simplified by a lookup table because the computation in the finite field can be can be pre-computed in a table form. However, this table is very large for uh, we need four T box, so it is four kilobytes. But uh, so four kilo word, four kilobytes. We can store this into the uh, share memory is within the limit. This is a good news. Then if you store everything into T box, the computation becomes very simple. We just need to access the T box, X all then, and you get uh, one data. Okay. There are two ways to implement AES. One is that I use one thread to encrypt one counter value. Another way is that I use many threads to uh, encrypt one, one uh, AES. Okay. So the first one we use cross grain, one thread, one counter value. And I use the 64 bit norms as uh, generated by the pseudo random number generator. Then I use the TID as the block counter. This means every thread will be a different counter values. So this is how we implement the counter mode in GPU. Then of course the, the key expansion, key is already expanded in CPU we, because we don't need to expand it frequently. We store this into the share memory and we use four T boxes which is also shared inside the share memory. The uh, snippets of the code looks like this. We have many rounds, 10 rounds. So each round will be reading four tables and then you, you compute one word and we need four words. Then you com complete one round and go to the next round, the next round until all uh, 10 rounds are complete. Okay, we can also do it in a fine grain manner because we observe that, okay, let's go back here. There are four words over here. Each word is 32 bit, okay? Because AES is uh, 128 bit. Okay, they are computing 128 bit print text. We can actually use four threads to do a one AES. This thread will focus on one word. Okay. In this case, it's called a fine grain implementation. And because we use four threads to compute, then we need to share the data between different threads. So uh, the difference between these two implementation is that cross grain is always giving very good throughput. Okay. But the problem is when you start to, uh, when the data size is not so big, uh, you do not fully utilize the GPU resources. Okay, But the fine grain is always fully utilizing the GPU resources. That's why you see in at some point of time, okay, if the data size is small, fine grain will be a better solution. Okay, I can use small thread to compute AES. However, when the data size is large, that means enough computation, then GPU will be favoring the uh, 
cost grid approach, one track, one AES. So in this case, the throughput gap is very big. So we will, if we put this into the TRS application, that means if you have a lot of workload, then the cost grain implementation is actually a better solution. These are the results for three different GPUs. Then another application that I want to share is the SHA-3. Okay. SHA-3, can, you, you can use this for cracking password or maybe mining the cryptocurrency. I don't know. Okay. Uh, SHA-3 is the name of the original algorithm is called Kachak. It was standardized in 2012 as secure hash function, secure hash algorithm three. So it is uh, starting to get um, attention from the industry because SHA-1 is already broken. SHA-2 is, is uh, in danger, probably in, the, in five or 10 years, they will not be used. So SHA-3 is the alternative. It is based on a sponge function, very different from SHA-1 and SHA-2. So you have, uh, in short, you have 1,600 bits. It is, uh, if you have many data, it will be hashed by the F function. This is called uh, absorbing. Then you can keep squeezing data out of this hash function. So it is very different from the SHA-1 and SHA-2. Uh, how to map the Kachak SHA-3 into the GPU track? Since there are 1,600 bits, it can be organized in this way. Five times five, this is the state of the Kachak. Then each state, we have 64 bits. Okay, So this is just nice, 1,600. And because of this, we can actually map the 25 state each thread compute one state, okay? But I mentioned earlier that uh, we actually have a, a unit called a WAP. This unit is actually a hardware concept. All threads inside the WAP will compute the same instruction. So even though we only use 25 threads, we still need to launch 32 threads and let the seven threads be uh, being either. It's a waste. But because of this algorithm, we cannot do anything further. We need to uh, sacrifice some of the threads being idle. Then we can launch many blocks. Each block will compute one catch up. Okay. So what happens is this. This is the function inside the catch up. We have five steps. Okay. They can be beautifully mapped into the C code like this. Okay. So what I want to point out here is that uh, if I use the share memory to store the states, remember the 25 states over here, okay, these 25 states. If I use the share memory to store it, what we observe over here is that uh, every time the ketchup will access five data in one cycle. Okay? That means the, the possibility to have bank conflict is uh, quite possible okay? because the banks are organized in 32. So if you access in the multiple of five, then there's a high possibility after a few rounds, you will see the bank conflict. Okay? This is something we cannot avoid. But because the algorithm designed this way, we also cannot do anything to get rid of this uh, bank conflict. But Fortunately, we can use the warp shuffle. As I mentioned just now, if I use only one warp uh, 25 thread to compute the SHA-3, then I can actually do the data sharing within a warp. So if I can remove C and D, but I need to uh, store it into register. Okay. So what this is what we do. We store C and D into register, and then you can see this very similar to the share memory version. Okay, just that the accessing instruction is different, but the content can be uh, accessed through register instead of the share memory. But A, we cannot get rid of this because uh, we still need to store some data in the share memory to, to be accessed. <clears throat> but
by the final result. Okay. So the benefit is usually not very high, but you can see about 10 to 20%. Okay. For our case, if I use share memory, I will get this 30 mega, uh, 30 million of SHA-3 computation per second. If I use the WAP Shuffle version, I will get 18% of improvement. That's what we can get uh, from the WAP Shuffle. So in conclusion, uh, the GPU requires some effort to optimize the uh, memory, for example, share, global memory, share memory, and also register. And most of the time you will see that the algorithm that is easy to be parallelized can get the best benefit from GPU. If this is not a parallel algorithm, then you need some effort to design it to make it parallel. And if this algorithm does, is not very friendly to the memory access pattern, then we need to reorganize the data to make it uh, more optimized for the memory accesses. And most of the time, I spend time in doing these two things. Okay, optimize the memory access and look for the pattern which is good for memory efficiency. However, I can say that a GPU is very useful uh, if you use it correctly and it can be used to compute many algorithms. And the most important thing, it is not expensive and it is a hidden supercomputer that you can use uh, for your own research or other purposes. Okay, so thanks. <clears throat> Okay, thanks uh, for the for listening. So, any, 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 any question from the audience? Participants are requested to kindly post the questions in the question answer section or in the comment box. Participants, if you have any questions or you have any query, please post it in the question answer section or in the chat box. So, sir, I think uh, till now, sir, there is no questions from the uh, audience. And, uh, we hope that, sir, they have got the knowledge from your talk. Okay, what is you, sir? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Lee, thank you for, for, uh, so much for your valuable uh, speech. And I think that it will be helpful to your uh, participants a lot. So thank you. You have spent a lot of time for, for <laughs> discussing this thing. Okay. You have, you have the participant is having any queries. Then later on, we can uh, they can send the email to you. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Mm. So our next speaker is uh, Alice uh, Mary. Uh, she is postdoctoral researcher in the uh, OSIC camps of uh, in KU Leuven, Belgium. She is working on lattice-based cryptography and more precisely on algorithm problems related to the algorithm uh, algebraic lattice. Before that, she was a PhD student at uh, ENS Lyon France under the supervision of Lemon. And during her PhD, she also worked on the index to index to uh, abuse. Now she will speak on overview, overview of the lattice based cryptography. So, uh, Dr. Alice, uh, you are requested to uh, continue your, your presentation. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, 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 it is visible. Okay, so thank you for the invitation. Uh, so my objective today is to give some introduction to lattice-based cryptography. So I've been told that uh, most of the audience might not know what it is. So I'm going to be very uh, introductive and I want to show you the different aspects of lattice-based cryptography. Um, I won't show you all the aspects, but I want to show you some of them. And the main thing I want uh, you to take away from this talk is that lattice-based cryptography is a very wide 
uh, research area. And you can do lattice-based cryptography without even knowing what is a lattice or without even knowing what is cryptography. So you can have very extreme things. So here is a small picture with some keywords that are related to lattice-based crypto. So I've tried to order them. It's like, uh, yeah, some order. I'm not saying that's the good way to order them, but anyway. Uh, so you, as I said, you can have some area of lattice-based crypto where you really focus on lattices and algorithmic problem on lattices. And there is a lot of mass involved and you don't really need to know how it applies to cryptography to do that. You only need to know that lattices are used in crypto and that some algorithmic problems are important for crypto, but you don't even need to know how to construct uh, protocols from that. On the other end of the uh, picture, you can also construct cryptography primitive, like encryption schemes, signatures, uh, fully homomorphic encryption, obfuscation, functional encryption, a lot of advanced cryptographic primitives. And you can do that without knowing what is a lattice. Like you can construct cryptographic primitive based on lattices without even knowing what is a lattice. And what is nice and why you can do that is because we have some very nice algorithmic problem in between that you may have heard about, like LWE, Sys, and True, and the ring variant of ring LWE and ring Sys. <clears throat> And these problems, these algorithmic problems, you can state them with very simple formulation, only linear algebra matrices and things like that. And they are kind of an intermediate world between mass and crypto. So you can construct cryptographic primitives with no, by knowing only what is LWE and you don't need to know what is a lattice. And you can also be interested into how lattices relate to LWE and don't know anything about how LWE is used in cryptography. So you have all this uh, wide range of um, potential questions. And so that's what I want to show you today, like a bit of all these three areas here. And that's going to be the plan of the talk. So I'm going to start by describing what is a lattice and what are the algorithmic problems that we're interested in on lattices. Uh, then I will describe algorithmic problems that we use in crypto, so LWE, CIS, et cetera. And on the third part, we will see some cryptographic primitives, very simple one that we can construct from lattices. So again, I'm not assuming any previous knowledge on lattices, so I'm going to start from scratch. And let's start with lattices. And let's start by defining what is a lattice. So if you have never seen a lattice before, this is a picture of a lattice in dimension two. So the mathematical definition of a lattice is you pick a basis, so a set of linearly independent vectors. Here, for instance, you pick the two red vectors that are linearly independent. And then a lattice is going to be the set of all integer linear combination of these vectors. So you get a bunch of points. It's infinite. And so we say that the basis you started with the vectors, it's a basis of your lattice. And the dimension of the lattice is also usually called the rank. So here, the rank or the dimension is 2. Uh, okay, so let me say a few words about bases because that's very important. So here, the points, you can generate them by taking all integer linear combination of the two red vectors, but you can also generate them by taking integer linear combinations of the blue vectors. So you don't have a unique basis for a lattice. You may have a lot of different bases. And some of them, we say they are good and other ones, they are not so good. So here, for instance, the red basis, it's a good one because it's made of short vectors. And the blue basis, we don't like it because it's made of long vectors. So basis, as I said, it's very important in lattices because when you want to do some computations on lattices, you need a way to represent a lattice. You're not going to store on your computer all the points of the lattice because it's an infinite set. 
So the way you represent a lattice is by providing a basis. And from a basis, then you can construct any point. So in all the rest of the talk, when I say I want an algorithm that do something for lattices, I assume that the input of the algorithm is a basis of a lattice. And I cannot assume that I have a good basis. So it can be any arbitrary basis of the lattice. So you should keep in mind, most of the time, we're going to start with a bad basis, so a basis like the blue one with very long vectors. And then we still want to be able to do some stuff on the lattice. So let's go to this algorithmic problem. What are the things we might want to do on lattices? So as I said, uh, I'm assuming that my algorithm take as input, I want it to work for any lattice and for any basis of the lattice. So I don't want to assume that I need some specific basis. It should work for any basis. So some example of problems I might want to solve. Um, here is a list. So first one is equality. I'm given two bases. I want to test if the two corresponding lattices are the same or not. That's first question we might want to solve. We might also want to test inclusion if one lattice is included into another one or not. <clears throat> we might want to intersect two lattices also. We have one lattice, a basis for one lattice, a basis for another lattice. The, we know that the intersection of the two is a lattice. How can we compute a basis of this intersection? Or another problem is if I give you a basis of a lattice, can you find a short vector of the basis? Uh, sorry, a short vector of the lattice, which is non-zero because zero is always a vector in a lattice, but we don't want the trivial one. We want some non-zero short vector. Or again, uh, last thing, if I give you some target point somewhere in the space and I ask you what is the point of the lattice that is the closest to this target, how can you do that from a basis of the lattice? So these are a bunch of examples of lattice problems. And not all of them are easy to solve. So essentially, the first three problems, you can solve them easily given any basis of any lattice. Meaning, so here I'm speaking from a theoretical point of view. So what I say is easy means you can solve it in polynomial time. And when I say that something is hard, it means for the moment, we don't know any algorithm that solves this problem in polynomial time. So the first three problems like testing equality, inclusion, intersection, you can do that by doing mostly linear algebra on the basis, and you can do that in polynomial time. The last two problems, for the moment, we don't know how to solve them efficiently. And that's why we are interested in these problems for cryptography, because we want some hard problem. And so from some hard problem, we will be able to construct secure cryptographic primitives. So the first three, I'm going to forget about them. It's something easy, but the last two, that's the one I want to focus on. So let me give you a bit more information about these two problems. So the first one is called the shortest vector problem. It's a very famous problem related to lattices, probably the famous one. Um, so it's the following. You are given a basis of a lattice, and you want to find a shortest vector of a lattice of the lattice. So here, the red vector is one of the two shortest vector. You can see that if I do minus this vector, I get another shortest vector. So it's usually not unique, but it's uh, one of the shortest vector. And I'm going to write lambda one. That's the Euclidean norm of this shortest vector. So that's SVP, the shortest vector problem. You can have an approximation variant of this problem where you don't want to find the shortest vector, but some short vector up to some approximation factor times lambda one. So here, for instance, with approximation factor two, you want to find a point in this uh, sphere. And uh, this is called approximate SVP. 
So that's for short vector. Now the closest vector problem, CVP, is the following. You are given again a lattice, and you are also given a target T, which is somewhere in the real space spanned by the lattice. And you want to find the point of the lattice that is the closest to T. And again, you have an approximation variant of this problem where you just want to find a vector that is not too far away from your target. So as I said, these two problems, SVP and CVP, shortest and closest vector problem, they are supposed to be hard to solve. So what I mean with that is, so it's going to be hard to solve when the dimension n of the lattice increases. So in dimension two here on my picture, it's easy. But if you imagine some lattices of much larger dimension, it becomes harder and harder to solve. And this is true even if you allow quantum computer. So this will be very useful because then you can construct post-quantum cryptography from these problems. And so of course, if you consider the approximation variant of the problems, they become easier and easier when you increase the approximation factor. But if you keep a relatively small approximation factor, let's say polynomial in the dimension, then the problems are still very hard to solve. So how, how much hard are these problems? Here you have uh, the best algorithm we know for solving the shortest vector problem and the closest vector problem. Even if you have a quantum computer, we don't know how to do better than that. And here I'm plotting the runtime of the algorithm depending on the approximation factor we want to achieve. So if you want to solve the exact problems with no approximation factor, approximation factor one, you see that the algorithm runs in time two to the n, so exponential in the dimension of the lattice. On the other extremity, if you are okay with very large approximation factor, so with a two to the n approximation factor, you can have an algorithm that solves this problem in polynomial time, and you have all the trade-offs in between. So if you want an approximation factor two to the square root 10, you can reach it in time two to the square root 10. So for cryptography, we want hard problems. So basically cryptography will happen in this regime. We will uh, use the closest vector problem and the shortest vector problem with small approximation factors so that the best algorithm we have is exponential in the dimension. Okay, so we have hard problems. Uh, let me just tell you, give you some numbers about how hard this is. So uh, I want to give you numbers about solving exact uh, SVP, so exact shortest vector problem. So here I said the runtime, the best runtime is two to the n, but I mean, it's okay, it's a big O of two to the n. So what about practic in practice, how efficient are the algorithms we have? So if n is two, it's very small. And as I said, it's very easy in practice to find a short vector. We can do that even by hand. And I'm going to show you in on the next slide how to do that. Uh, yeah, you're going to see it's very simple and very efficient. If you start increasing the dimension, and if you are some regular person like me with a laptop and you don't want to implement your own algorithm, you just want to use what has been implemented in Python or Magma, you can go up to dimension 80 or 100, something like that. So that's for a regular user. If you have a very big computer and you are, um, and you are okay to spend a lot of time implementing very good algorithms uh, optimized for your computer, you can reach dimension 170. So that's the maximal dimension in which someone has ever been able to solve the shortest vector problem. And for cryptography, we are going to use lattices of dimension 500 or 1000, depending on the security level we want to reach. So, I mean, you can think that maybe 500 is not much larger than 170, but you have to keep in mind that the algorithm is exponential. So every time you increase the dimension by one, the runtime is multiplied by two. 
So there is a big yeah. gap between these two values. Okay, so um, before finishing this section on lattices and uh, yeah, the mathematical aspects of lattices, I want to show you a bit how to find short vectors in lattices. And so I'm going to do that in dimension two. So because first of all, in dimension two, it's easy to plot what's happening. So I can show you what is happening. It's not really representative because as I said, in dimension two, it's easy. And you should keep in mind that finding short vectors in lattices of large dimension is hard, but still the techniques we use in dimension two, they are roughly, I mean, also used for larger dimensions. So it will give you some intuition on uh, how to find short vectors in lattices. Okay, so in dimension two, the algorithm we can use to find short vector is called Lagrange Gauss. It works only for lattices of dimension two. And um, so it works in polynomial time and solves exact SVP. So let me show you a video of uh, this algorithm. So I'm going to stop sharing and then start sharing the video. Uh, I hope you see the video. Okay, so the principle of the algorithm is the following. So you have a lattice and a basis. Um, so, sorry, okay. Uh, on the left here of the video, you have the lattice. I'm just showing that so that you see what happens and you see what, yeah. Uh, the lattice and everything. But on a computer, you don't need to know what happen what's happened on the lattice. And as I said, on the computer, what you, the only thing you need is the basis. So here is the basis of your lattice. The first column is the coordinates of B1, and the second column are the coordinates of B2. So that's the only thing the computer is going to work with. But let's keep the picture on the left. So the first step of the algorithm is we're going to rotate the space so that B1 becomes horizontal. So we just do a rotation so that B1 becomes horizontal. It's not doing anything. It's just uh, going to be easier for us because once we update, we have updated the basis so that B1 is horizontal. And now since it's horizontal, the second coordinate of B1 is zero because there is no component on the vertical axis. So that's just for that. It's going to be easier for us to have this coordinate being zero in the matrix. So that's the first step. The second step, we are going to reduce B2 by a multiple of B1. So we are going to make B2 as small as possible by removing to it an integer multiple of B1. So here, if you look at the basis, we cannot modify this second coordinate of B2 because this is zero on B1. So you can remove as many multiples of B1 as you want. This is going to be unchanged. But you are going to try to reduce this coordinate as much as you can by subtracting integer coordinates of this, uh, integer multiple, sorry, of this coordinate. So this is just roughly doing a Euclidean division, except that you have real numbers instead of integers, but it's really just Euclidean division. So you find the best integer that makes you as close as possible to 2.9, and then you reduce B2. So we have reduced B2 as much as, I, as we could. And now we just swap the two vectors. And we are going to start again uh, all the steps. So we are going to go back to the first step, which is rotate so that B1 becomes horizontal. You should see that now B1 is smaller than previously, right? So B1 is horizontal, so we have a zero on the, this coordinate. Then we are going to reduce B2 by an integer multiple of B1 to make it as small as possible. So we do a Euclidean division. 
we reduce B2 and now B1 and B2 are as small as we can. So we have obtained an optimal basis and one of the two vectors is uh, the shortest vector of the lattice. So yeah, we swap and that's all we are done. So essentially in two steps here, we have reduced uh, the basis to the sh um, shortest basis of the lattice. Um, let me share again this other screen. So I, I've seen a question. Um, maybe it's too late to answer this question. I don't know when it was about differences between SVP and CVP. So SVP is um, you have, so let me just go back a bit. SVP is you want shortest vector problem. You want to find the short vector in the lattice. And CVP is you have your target and you want to find a point of the lattice close to the target. So the two problems are slightly different, but not that much different. And in fact, the best algorithms we have for one are the same as for the other, roughly. If you can solve the shortest vector problem, you can solve the closest vector problem. And uh, conversely, so it's the same difficulty. Okay, so let's go back to um, the algorithm for lattices in dimension two. So yeah, so uh, I hope I've convinced you that in dimension two, it's very easy to find short vectors. You can do that in a few steps, just doing Euclidean divisions, um, but yeah, don't forget that it's only the case in dimension two. And when you start increasing n, it becomes much harder to solve. But still, so you have seen a bit of lattices and how to manipulate lattices. So that's all I wanted to show you about uh, lattices and lattice problems. And now I want to move on to um, LWE and CIS problems and how we can use them for cryptography. So first observation uh, from uh, the shortest vector problem and the closest vector problem are the following. So if you, okay, we have algorithmic problems that are hard to solve. So we want to use them for cryptography, but the main difficulty is that they are worst case problems. So what I mean by worst case is that we know that they are hard to solve on the worst case. So we don't have an algorithm that works for all lattices. But it might be the case that some lattices are still easy uh, for solving the shortest vector problem and the closest vector problem. Or maybe some basis of a lattice makes the problem much easier. We just know that there are some instances that are hard but we don't know which ones. And we don't know if these hard instances, if they are very frequent or just few of them. It's a bit the same if you think of cryptography and you say, hey, let's uh, base cryptography on NP hard problems. I know that SAT, satisfiability, I don't know, like so solving SAT formulas is NP hard. So let's base crypto on SAT. And the problem when you do that is that you don't know that when you pick a random SAT instance, you don't know if it's hard to solve. And most of the time, depending on what you call random instance, but for a natural distribution of randomness, a SAT instance is going to be very easy to solve. So you don't know how to sample hard instances. And that's why worst case problems are not very well uh, suited for crypto. And what we would like for crypto are what we call average case problem, which are problems that we know are hard with overwhelming probability when I pick a random instance of my problem. So let's see some examples. So SVP and CVP, they are worst case and we don't, I mean, yeah, they're not average case problems. So that's why we introduced some average case problems. And the first one, 
is the CIS problem short integer solution problem. It was introduced by Aitai in 96, and it's the following. So we have a few notations. So Q and B, they are both integers, and you should think of B as being quite small compared to Q. And I'm going to write, so this is quite uh, regular for lattice-based crypto, ZQ is Z mod Q. So the short integer solution problem is the following. You sample a uniform matrix A with more rows than columns. So you have M rows and N columns. And you want to find a short vector X, which is non-zero, such that X times A is zero mod Q. So thanks to the condition that M has sufficiently many rows, so we want M to be larger than N log Q, we know that there should exist a small solution, but uh, finding it is hard. And in fact, we can prove that, okay, so this is an approximative statement, but that's the idea of the reduction. If you can solve this problem with non-negligible probability, so non-negligible, you can think of like, let's say we want to solve it with probability more than two to the minus 80, then it means that you can solve the shortest vector problem in any lattice of rank n. So here it's a bit approximative. It's not SVP, but it's some variant of SVP that you can solve, but let's forget about it. Uh, so essentially, as long as you assume that the shortest vector problem is hard in the worst case, so there is at least one lattice in which this problem is hard, then you can prove that the cis problem is hard to solve and an attacker probability less than two to the minus 80 to be able to solve it when you pick a random instance A. So you can now use that for crypto, you can just pick a random matrix A and that can be your public key and you know that it's going to be hard on average with high probability. So um, yes. That's uh, the cis problem. Let me just mention, so you can, if you don't know about lattices, you can still understand the cis problem, right? It's just some problem that can be stated with matrices. You just need to know what is a matrix and what is modulo Q, and you can state this problem. So it's not obvious, probably at first, that this is related to lattices. So I just want to show you why this is related to lattices. So we have our problem, and I'm going to consider the lattice spanned by all the vectors in Zm, such that all the vectors x in Zm, such that x times a is zero mod q. This is a lattice, so it's a set of points here. And what we want to find is find a point x in this lattice, which is smaller than B on each coordinate. So essentially what we are trying to solve here is a sh shortest vector problem in this lattice. So even though you can state it with only matrices, this is really an average case, a uh, shortest vector problem. It's some lattice problem. Okay, so that's for CIS. Let's go to the learning with error problem, which is a bit more recent than CIS and um, usually more used in crypto. So if you have heard about lattices, probably you have heard about LWE and maybe not about CIS. So again, we have two integers Q and B. Uh, B is much smaller than Q. The LWE problem is the following. So there are a lot of variants of LWE. I'm just showing you one of them, which is maybe not the uh, most frequent one, but uh, it's still equivalent to all the other variants. So uh, LWE is the following. You are going to sample a square uniform matrix. And you are going to sample two short vectors S and E. 
Yeah, I didn't say that on the previous slides, but I'm trying to be consistent with colors. So blue is small, orange is uniform, and black is, we don't know. So you sample two short vectors S and E, your uniform matrix, square matrix A, and you are going to output A and a vector B, which is A times S plus E modulo Q. And the learning with error problem is recover S or E from this. You just have A and B. So just a few remarks on this problem, if that's the first time you see it. Um, so it's called learning with error because this is an error and you kind of want to learn this, but you have some errors on it. And if you didn't have any errors E, what you would get is A times S. And A is invertible with high probability. So from A times S and A, you can just invert A and recover the secret. So if E is zero, this is an easy problem. But when E is non-zero, this becomes harder to solve. And, um, and in fact, when E is non-zero, uh, this problem is as hard to solve on average as, again, uh, the shortest vector problem in any lattice of rank n. So again, if you assume that SVP is hard in the worst case, so it's, uh, there is at least one lattice in which the shortest vector problem is hard, which is what we currently believe, then it means that you cannot solve LWE with non-negligible probability. So if you sample A, S, and E uniformly with overwhelming probability, the problem, the LWE problem is going to be hard. And so again, like, like this, uh, oh, I see questions. Um, so ITI 96 is the reference is on the bottom of the slide. So it's, um, the, essentially, it's the first article constructing cryptography from lattices, uh, interesting cryptography from lattices. It was by uh, Aitai in 90, uh, 1996. And the other question was, I don't see it anymore. Yes. Um, where may we apply? SVP or CVP in crypto. So probably I answered it since, but let me say that again. Um, so we are not going to use SVP and CVP directly for crypto. We are going to use them via the LWE and the CIS problems. And I'm going to show you on the next uh, section how uh, LWE and CIS can be used to construct crypto. And the point is that these problems, we know that like uh, here, we know that if uh, these problems are hard to solve, if the shortest vector problem is hard to solve. So it's kind of via a chain of reductions, we show that if the cryptographic, if, sorry, let's start on the other hand. Um, if the shortest vector problem is hard to solve, then LWE is hard to solve, and then your cryptographic construction is secure. Okay, so going back to LWE. Um, so this is the statement of LWE, and again, like this, it can be stated with only linear algebra, and you don't need to know anything about lattices to state it or to use it. But let me still show you why this is a lattice problem. So here is the statement of the problem. And the lattice we are going to construct here is the set of all vectors x in Zn, which are of the form a times s mod q for some s. So the image of a modulo q. So this gives you a lattice and your vector b it's a s plus e, so it's a vector v of the lattice plus some e, which is small. So what you get here is that b is close to a point of the lattice, and what you would like to recover is this point of the lattice. If you can recover a times s, again, 
uh, A is going to be invertible with very high probability, so you can recover S. So this is a closest vector problem in the lattice L. You know the lattice L because it's defined only uh, as a function of A and you know A. You know the target B and you want to find the point of the lattice which is the closest to your target B. So let me just conclude on uh, the shortest short integer solution and learning with error problems. So they are now average case problem, meaning that um, they are hard. When you sample a random instance of CIS and LWE, it's hard to solve with overwhelming probability. And so you can use that for crypto because now when you sample, um, I mean, you have very small probability to sample a weak instance. So sample a weak key because these are going to be used to sample the key of your crypto system. And so again, um, these are kind of um, average case lattice problems. So the shortest vector problem, we don't know if we pick a random lattice, we don't know if it's hard, but thanks to CIS, the CIS problem gives us a way to define some lattices in which SVP is hard with high probability. The same thing for LWE, it gives us a way to define some lattices in which the closest vector problem is hard with high probability. So we can now forget about lattices for the rest of the talk. We are going to work only with CIS and LWE, which can be only defined in terms of matrices. So we don't need to know anything about lattices. But if you want to know why we believe that these problems are hard, it's because they are at least as hard as solving the shortest vector problem and the closest vector problem uh, on any lattice, which we believe is hard because for the moment, I mean, it's been an open problem for a very long time and we really don't know how to do better than two to the n. Okay, so that's, no, that's not the end of this second section. Let me just say a last thing about LWE, uh, which uh, makes it even more useful for cryptography, is that you have a decision variant of LWE, which is the following. So again, you are going to sample A uniform square matrix and S and E small. And now you are going to define B to be either a times S plus E, so like in LWE, or you take B uniform mod Q. And the problem is to guess, given only A and B, whether B was uniform or if it's of the form A times S plus E. So this is easier, at least uh, not harder than solving LWE, because if from this B, you can recover S and E, you can distinguish from uniform because if you run it on something uniform, you will see that it's not working. So it's no harder than uh, solving LWE, but it turns out to be the same difficulty as solving the search variant of LWE. So this decision variant is as hard as recovering S or E from uh, A, S plus E. But the fact that it's a decision problems make it easier to use for crypto. And we're going to see that when we want to construct encryption scheme, because when you want to construct an encryption scheme, uh, the security game is a decision game. The adversary has to guess yes or no for some problem. And then it's much easier to use some decision variant of LWE to base the security of your protocol than something where you have to search for a secret. So we are going to see that in the next section. So that was CIS and LWE. Um, as I said, now you can forget about the definition of lattice and the shortest and closest vector problem. We don't really need them anymore. We are going to see how to construct cryptographic primitives from the LWE and the CIS problem. And maybe that's a good time to check if there are any questions. Uh, how do I see questions? Uh, 
I don't think there is any questions. Or at least I can't see them. Okay. Um, okay, good. So let's go to the next section. So I'm going to start with uh, constructing a family of collision resistant hash function from the short integer solution problem. So I'm just going to recall uh, what is collision resistant hash functions. I don't know if everyone knows about that. So let me just say it very briefly. So you have a family of function from a set S to a set S prime. And you say that it's collision resistant hash function if it's compressing. So you want that the output set is smaller than the input set. And you want that it's collision resistant, meaning that for any probabilistic polynomial time adversary, the adversary should not be able to find a collision of the function, which is find two input x1 and x2, such that h of x1 is equal to h of x2, but x1 is different from x2. So this is what is stated here in this probability. You want that when you pick a random hash function from your family, then the probability that the adversary is able to find the pair x1, x2, such that h of x1 is h of x2, but x1 are different from x2, is negligible. So think of it as very small, smaller than 2 to the minus 80 or something like that. So that's collision resistant hash function. And we are going to construct such a family from the uh, short integer solution problem. So this is going to be the family of function. You have uh, functions that are parameterized by a matrix A. And the function is the following. So you take as input an x with binary coefficients, 0 and 1. And the output of the hash function is simply x times A, modulo q. So the input set uh, is going to be 0, 1 to the n. The output set is 0, q to the n, q minus 1, sorry, to the n. So it's going to be compressing if uh, m is sufficiently large compared to n and log q, which was anyway the condition we needed for the cis problem if we want to have solution to the cis problem. So this is uh, always the case. And the second um, property is that it's indeed collision resistant. So how do we prove that it's collision resistant? We prove that if we have an adversary A that managed to break the cryptographic uh, hash function, the collision resistance of the family G. So if we have an algorithm A that is able to find collisions in these functions, then we are able to construct an adversary A cis that breaks the short integer solution problem. And so if we assume that this is hard, then there is no adversary against uh, or collision resistant hash function. So how do we construct this ACS? It's very simple. So ACS is an algorithm that takes as input a random matrix A and wants to find a vector X such that X times A is zero mod Q and X is small. That's the cis problem, if you remember. We want x a equals 0 and x small. So what a cis is going to do is that it's going to run the algorithm a on input the function parameterized by a. So because this is an adversary breaking the collision resistance of hash functions, of the of, or family of, of hash functions, it's going to output a pair x1, x2, that is a collision of the hash function. So it means that x1a is equal to x2a mod q, and x1 is different from x2. So it's not yet exactly what we want. We just have x1a equal x2a. But if we just subtract x1 minus x2, now we get that x1 minus x2a is equal to 0 mod q. So we have a solution to the cis problem. We have x1 minus x2 times a is 0 mod q. And because x1 and x2 are binary, when I do x1 minus x2, I get something with coefficients in minus 1, 0, 1. So it's small. So I get a solution to my cis problem. So that's all that's a security proof. If I can break 
this uh, collision resistant hash functions, then I can break this. And I'm assuming that it's hard. So there is no adversary against the collision resistant hash functions. So that's uh, what I wanted to say about uh, this first application. Let's now uh, see an application of the LWE uh, problem and how to construct an, an encryption scheme from LWE. So let me again just recall what is an encryption scheme. You have three algorithms. The first one, a public key encryption scheme. The first algorithm is going to generate a secret key and a public key. The second algorithm is going to take as input the public key and a message. I'm going to encrypt only one bit of message, zero or one, and it's going to output a ciphertext. And the last algorithm, decryption algorithm, it takes the secret key, the ciphertext, and it outputs hopefully the good uh, message. So how do we formalize that? We want correction of the scheme, meaning that for any pair of public key and secret key generated by the algorithm, we would like that if we encrypt the message, any message with the public key and then decrypt with the secret key, we recover the message. And we would like security, and I'm going to focus on chosen plain text attack security, meaning that I wanted for any adversary A, probabilistic polynomial time adversary A, the adversary cannot distinguish whether the message that has been encrypted was zero or one. So that's what's written in this big formula. It means that if the adversary knows the public key and a ciphertext where the ciphertext is a ciphertext of zero, then it cannot distinguish it from knowing the public key and the ciphertext where the ciphertext is a ciphertext, it's an encryption of one. So that's CPA security. Okay, uh, so how do we construct an encryption scheme from LWE. Um, so that's the scheme I'm going to present you is one of the multiple variants of what's called Regev's encryption scheme. So we do the following. The key generation algorithm is going to sample some LWE samples. So we are going to sample A square uniform, S and E small, and the secret key is going to be the short vector S and the public key is going to be the LWE sample, so A, the matrix A and the vector B, which is A, S plus E. Now to encrypt the message, we are going to sample two short vectors, S prime and E prime with E prime slightly larger than S prime. So dimension N plus one compared to N. And we are going to compute the ciphertext in the following way. So we do S prime times the matrix A, which we have concatenated with the vector B. So it's now a rectangle matrix, uh, n times n plus one, n times n plus one, plus the noise e prime, plus, and this is where you put your message, you put a vector which is zero, 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 and the last coordinate is m times q over two. So q over two here is just, in a sense, the largest element modulo q. If you take all your elements between minus q over 2 and q over 2, then the largest one you can get is q over 2. And OK, so this is just key gen and encryption. I still need to show you how to decrypt. But before going to decryption, I just want, because we have on the same slide everything, so I'm going to show you that this scheme is secure. We don't need to know that's. Uh, something to be noted. You don't need to know how to decrypt to prove that uh, an encryption scheme is secure. You just need to know how to encrypt. So I'm going to show you. Um, so the security, remember the security definition, we want to uh, show that a ciphertext encrypting zero is indistinguishable from a ciphertext encrypting one. So the way we are going to do that is the following. We are going to apply the decision LWE assumption multiple times. So the first time, if you remember decision LWE, it says that it's hard to distinguish this B from some uniformly random vector B. So I can assume now that this B is uniform because L decision LWE says that I cannot distinguish B from uniform. So now B is uniform. And now here, 
Before I had some vector B, which I didn't know what it was, but now I'm assuming it's uniform. So now this big matrix is uniform and I can simply uh, apply again decision LWE in a transpose version. Here, what I get is something small time matrix plus something small. This is just LWE, but I've just transposed everything. So the column vectors are row vectors, but I can assume again that it's uniform by decision LWE assumption. So this becomes something uniform. And so my ciphertext is a uniform vector plus a message, but whatever the message was, something uniform plus something fixed is always uniform. So now I cannot distinguish if M was zero or one because I'm going to add to it something that is uniform mod Q. So I don't know, I cannot, I statistically cannot distinguish from zero or one. So that proves that the scheme is secure, assuming that decision and WE is hard to solve. Let's just go briefly to decryption because we have a secure scheme, but if we cannot decrypt, it's not very useful. So this is just a reminder. The ciphertext is going to be this shape and the secret key is S. So to decrypt, we are just going to multiply the vector C by the vector, the secret vector S and minus one on the bottom coordinate. This gives us just one integer mod Q, which we take between minus Q over two and Q over two. And we look at it, if it's small, if it's close to zero, we say that the encrypted message was M. And if X is close to Q over two or minus Q over two, we say that the encrypted message was one. And why is it correct? Uh, so you can just write everything and you see that it works. So let me just write it. Uh, C times S minus one, if I developed what I've I mean, just replace C by the expression of C, we get this quantity. So C S prime A S minus S prime B plus E prime S minus one extra. I'm also going to write B as uh, A S plus B. And now you see that here I have S prime A S minus S prime A S. So it's going to be zero. And I'm left with my message times Q over two plus something that is blue. And remember blue is small. So this, all this is small. So what I get is something small plus M times Q over two. If M is zero, this is small. And if M is one, this is Q over two plus something small. So this is close to Q over two. So decryption is correct. So that's all I wanted to say about um, not completely all. Let me just mention if you have heard about the NIST post quantum standardization process. So it's a process that has been started by the American National Institute of Standard and Technology and Techniques, Technology, I don't remember what is T, uh, in 2017. And the objective is to find a new standards for encryption schemes, public key encryption schemes. Uh, that are post quantums because the one we use for the moment are not post quantum, so we want to develop new, new standards and also signature schemes. But I'm going to forget about signatures here. So, as I said, it started in 2017, and at the beginning, there was 48 encryption candidates. Now, there have been several rounds of attacks and uh, trying to compare which schemes were more efficient, and we have only four candidates left. And three of them are based on lattices. So really lattices are used, a very promising way to construct post-quantum encryption schemes and post-quantum cryptography in, in general. And in the three schemes based on lattices, two of them use essentially the core of the algorithm is the regf encryption scheme I just showed you with LWE. So it's really used as a base scheme. And then you do a lot of optimization to try to improve efficiency, but that's as uh, the base of two of the four candidates for the NIST uh, post-quantum standardization process. Okay, so that's essentially all I wanted to uh, tell you. Uh, let me conclude. So I just want, before the true conclusion, mentioning one last topic about lattices, which I didn't mention, and which I think is very interesting. I mean, at least that's uh, what I'm interested in about lattices. So let me just say that very briefly. 
Um, so if you remember, we said at the beginning that a lattice is represented by a basis. So when you store a lattice on your computer, you have the basis, which is an n by n matrix. And so you need to store n square coefficients. And n square, if you want n to be 500 or 1000, and the coefficients are all of the order of 1000, that can become too, that becomes a bit large. So um, you might want to use structured basis. So for instance, this is an example of a structured basis. Every row is the previous row shifted by one. So this way you only need to store the first row. So you only need to store 500 coefficients and coefficients instead of n square, which makes the schemes much more efficient. And if you have heard about ring LWE, that's essentially it. Like ring LWE is LWE with structured basis. So this is not the only way to have a structured basis, but this is one of the possibility. And so this helps improve efficiency of uh, algorithms. And in practice, I think you can gain something like a factor 1000 by considering structured lattices. And so most of the NIST um, candidates and all the ones that are left at the third round, they use structured lattices because they are much more efficient. But the question is, once you add structure to your lattice, maybe finding short vector is easier. So we don't know for the moment any algorithm that exploit this structure, but it's not clear that we are not making the algorithm weaker by adding the structure. So that's some very important open questions, which uh, I just wanted to mention before finishing the talk. So um, let me conclude. So the takeaway I want you to remember from this talk, probably the most important thing I tried to show you is that there is a very wide uh, range of questions involving lattice-based crypto. And if you are more like math, if you like math, or if you like programming, or if you like, I mean, you can find anything you want probably uh, related to lattice-based crypto. So you can really do a lot of different things. And um, it's some important research area currently because it's probably the most promising one, at least for now, for constructing post-quantum cryptography. So there is a lot of research that has uh, been developed in lattice-based crypto. So uh, it has a, some impact on real life. And also it's some research as well that is still relatively young. So if you remember, I said ITI 96 was one of the first um, to construct lattice-based crypto. So it's 20, roughly 20 years old. And there are still a lot of open questions. So many interesting things to do. So that's all I wanted to say. And if there are any more questions, I can answer them or I can answer them later on in the chat. Uh, if you don't have questions now. Oh, there is a question. How computationally complex is it to do the encryption using LWE? Can you give as a comparison to the current schemes or the elliptic curve schemes? Yeah, um, so I'm not an expert in that. So I'm going to uh, say things not very, uh, yeah, I'm going to say what I know. Um, so encryption using LWE, as I said, so for the NIST competition, all the very efficient schemes based on lattices, they don't use LWE, they use ring LWE because ring LWE has more structure and it becomes much more efficient than uh, LWE. So in terms of size of the keys, for instance, you gain a factor 1,000 if you compare. So there was one scheme at the NIST, at the second round of the NIST competition that used uh, LWE without structure, and all the other one used LWE with structure. And um, there was a factor 1,000 in the size of the key between structure and no structure. So there is this. Uh, I mean, if you use non-structural LWE, it's not very efficient. It's still reasonable, but not very efficient. And if you use ring LWE, 
And if you want to compare that to um, elliptic curve schemes, so I'm, I don't want to say something wrong, but I think it's roughly comparable to elliptic curves. Um, probably, probably slower, but not much. I mean, compared to the algorithms that are currently used um, in real life, it's a bit slower, but not much slower. But I cannot say much more than that. Uh, yeah. So, any more question from the uh, participant? Any more question? Ma'am, we think that you have already answered many questions from the question answer sections. Yeah. Devasis, give us uh, many questions have been answered uh, by uh, Ma'am during the session only. The question answer section is yes, picked all the questions. Okay, okay. So thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Alice, for thank your you. valuable uh, speech. And it is, uh, it is uh, I definitely it is helpful to the participants. And uh, that is very informative. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Ali. See you later. Okay. Thanks. Uh -huh. See you later. So, uh, now our next speaker, Dr. Uh, David Galindo. David Galindo is an associate professor in computer security at School of Computer Science. At the University of uh, Birmingham, with nearly 20 years of experience in applied cryptography research. He is a member of the University Center for Cybersecurity and Privacy. He is also head of cryptography in Cambridge based AI and digital uh, economic startup uh, since, uh, since I. And uh, his research, uh, his, uh, his work has been published in top academic venue in computer security and has been developed by government uh, government so, uh, he will speak on security models and design for e-voting on blockchain so dr uh, david uh, you are most welcome to continue your speech thank you thank you um Devasis, for the um introduction i hope you can hear me well yeah yeah, yeah? yeah. Okay, great. Um, so share screen. This is the one. Um, can you see my slides well? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is visible, sir. Okay. Um, so um, the the aim of of my talk today is to uh, give um, an overview of uh, computational cryptography approaches to uh, defining security for cryptography protocols, and uh, because of the um, of the experience that I have had in industry so far has been with. Uh, electronic voting protocols and, um, and blockchain. So those are the two scenarios that I'm going to consider. And um, it's, it's useful uh, to also describe some of the canonical designs uh, in order to understand these, uh, these, these security models. So it's, it's, not, it's going to be a talk that is not going to be uh, following the detail of the, of the different cryptographic primitives um, it's, it's more about getting to getting a bit familiar with uh, how we define um, security and um, and then what, what does it mean in practice? That do we capture the, the a, a real setting for or, of a, a company or a government um, implementing those protocols? Is something that is left? Is something that um, we can improve? We we will we will try to answer that. Um, this work is something that I haven't done my, myself. So the, the research that uh, is behind the, the, the talk today. So this, uh, these are some of the colleagues I have been working with 
for the, the last few years. So first, um, a definition of a uh, um, cryptographic protocol. Um, it's uh, a definition that I have, uh, I picked uh, from uh, Wikipedia, but I think it's a, it's a very good definition. Uh, a cryptographic protocol is an ab abstract or concrete protocol. Abstract if it's something that uh, uses uh, generic primitives, for instance, and concrete if it uses a, a very particular primitive. Uh, so it's a protocol that performs a security related function and applies cryptographic methods often as, as, as sequences of cryptographic primitives. Uh, a protocol describes how the algorith algorithm should be used. Um, important words here to remember are cryptographic methods, or cryptographic primitives, which are different from cryptographic methods, and we, we, will, we will see uh, examples in the, in the next few slides. Um, today we, are, we use, uh, in our daily lives, cryptographic protocols um, quite frequently. Um, in, um, for instance, in uh, mess messaging um, uh, to secure the transfer layer of, of, of the web um, to, in order to take money from an uh, ATM or to pay contactless or even, uh, there are even now forms of money that are based purely on cryptography, such as uh, Bitcoin cryptocurrency. What is different in the case of a cryptographic protocol? What is the particular difference that we have that make, makes them um, particularly difficult to get right when compared to a general um, computer science protocol is the fact that we have adversaries. So we need to design protocols that do not only do the work that they are supposed to do if the parties follow the instructions that we write in the description of our protocol, but we need to achieve such a certain functionality of that uh, protocol in the presence of an adversary. So those are parties that are uh, willing to de deviate from the protocol. In particular, they, um, they may read the chain messages that maybe some of the parties will, need, will want to keep confidential. So then they will be um, confronted with the uh, problem of whether to engage in the protocol or not if they don't want their messages to be, um, to be read. They could also intercept communications in the sense that they could get the communication and uh, hold it for some time or even not deliver it to the, uh, to the end party. Finally, um, they could also build and send messages and participate in the protocol uh, trying to impersonate other, other parties in the protocol. Um, and, and of course, you know, we know about cybersecurity problems and this is not something that uh, is, is just um, uh, an imaginary situation. This is happening and it can have very uh, profound consequences. And this, this is just a random example uh, in the case of uh, WhatsApp that uh, there are um, uh, companies trying to hack it in order to, uh, to, to, to spy on, on, on certain uh, distinguished um, citizens. Okay, so this is the first uh, example of um, um, cryptographic primitive, and it's um, public encryption. Uh, in public encryption, we have a distinguished party who is the receiver. This receiver will have a, um, a public key and a private key. The private key will be only known to the receiver, and this public key and private key, they, they form a pair, they are related to each other, once we have a public key as a sender, we can communicate uh, confidentially with the receiver. And what we do is we take, uh, we take an encryption algorithm that uses the public key and the message that we call plain text that we uh, want to uh, send in a, in a confidential way. And that gives, uh, as a result, a ciphertext. This ciphertext then um, uh, goes through the uh, insecure channel that may be, uh, may be under um, eavesdropper um, uh, presence. And then we have a decryption algorithm that takes the private key corresponding to the public key and the cipher takes and record the original plain text. So that is uh, pretty well known if, 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 if you are familiar with uh, cryptography and, and security. Then we have the syntax of these protocols because uh, as, as uh, I was saying earlier, one of the things we want to do is to see how we define security for cryptographic protocols. So obviously we start by defining the, the, the security of the underlying uh, building blocks. 
In the case of a public encryption scheme, we have three algorithms. We have a key generation algorithm that is going to give us the uh, pair of public and secret keys. What is important to um, uh, realize about this algorithm is that it's going to be probabilistic. So if two different people run this algorithm at two different times, then the outputs are going to be completely different. We have the encryption algorithm that allows to, us to uh, embed the plain text into ciphertext. This one is also normally um, probabilistic. If we run it uh, twice on the same public key and the same uh, message, then we will obtain different ciphertext. Sometimes we refer to the internal coins, random coins that this algorithm is going to be to, to use because it's a probabilistic algorithm explicitly, but that's not something that is giving us input to the uh, algorithm. It's something that the algorithm will toss those coins internally. And then finally, we have the uh, encryption algorithm that uh, reverts the encryption process and will uh, open the, uh, the plain text that is embedded in the cipher. Now, how, will, how do we define security of an encryption scheme? So the standard way to, to define it is uh, through um, uh, what we call indistinguishability of encryptions. And in here, what we have is an adversary that is trying to force this uh, encryption algorithm and is trying to break the confidentiality. And we are the ones that are um, trying to measure whether the encryption scheme is secure or not. And then what we do is that we play with this adversary, we create the public key. Uh, we don't give the adversary the secret key, but we do give the adversary the public key. And then the adversary is allowed to choose two messages of the same length. And then what we're going to do is to encrypt one of them. And we are going to choose which one we encrypt by tossing uh, a random coin. So that will be, uh, um, uh, that is represented by this bit B and it will be zero or one with probability one half in each case. Then we encrypt the message, we give the cipher to the adversary, and the adversary needs to guess uh, which message we encrypted. Now, a bit more formally is uh, we run the key generation al uh, algorithm. We are the ones uh, that want to um, measure and check whether a given uh, encryption scheme is secure or not. So we run the key generation algorithm, we obtain the public key, we give the public key to the adversary, and then we uh, choose this uh, random uh, message to um, the, the adversary gives us, as, as I was saying earlier. Sorry? Any question? Let me see. Oh, yes, there's a question. Oh, no. um, so, then the, once the adversary gives us these uh, messages of the same length, um, we encrypt one of them. And now they need to guess which is the message that we encrypted. And we are going to declare this adversary to be successful if the probability of probably minus one half is not uh, is significant. If that probability is not significant, we say that this probability is negligible. And then that means that the encryption is being has in this negligibility. to um, build encryption um, schemes that are projected to be, um, to be secure. And uh, uh, this, has been, um, this has been mentioned before in the, in the, in the, in the previous talk. Someone was uh, referring to elliptic curves. So one way that we can build these encryption schemes is by using uh, secure elliptic curves and more generally different human group, groups. And in here, what we are going to have is, to, uh, is a commutative cyclic group, which means that we are going to have a, a group with a, a, a product operation. And um, the elements of this group are going to be, uh, uh, we can obtain them by raising um, a certain element, which we call the generator. In this case, in this, case this uh, uh, element represented by the letter G, by raising this um, uh, generator to successive exponentiations. Um, the cardinality of these groups normally we um, want uh, to be a, a prime and we uh, note this prime in here by the uh, letter Q. And we have the property that G to the power Q gives us the uh, neutral element in this group. 
we, we write the fact that this group is cyclic and can be generated by G by using this terminology over here. And what we can observe now is that every element in this group can be uniquely written as an exponential that takes as the, the basis, the uh, uh, generator, and then an exponent, which is an integer in ZQ. This integer uh, x is called the discrete logarithm of uh, the element h to the base g. And we uh, write it like this log with respect to the basis g of h or in, uh, with, the, um, uh, with a d because it's a discrete logarithm. Now, these problems are useful to build cryptography because we conjecture that there are certain underlying problems that are difficult to solve in polynomial time, where uh, this polynomial time is always a measure with respect to the, um, the length of the, um, of the prime cube in this case. And what we conjecture is that if we have a generator for this cyclic group, and then we have a element taking a random in that group, then computing the discrete logarithm of that uh, element with respect to the generator, that is computing the integer such that the exponentiation of G to that integer gives us, gives us back H, it's difficult, it's infeasible in polynomial time. Uh, that's enough for now. Uh, because as I said, I don't want to get into the details of the algorithms, but it's more about the, uh, the security definitions. But we have other problems in this group that uh, are easier to solve than this logarithm problem and still are conjectured to be hard to solve. And some of you may know them. If you don't know them, that's, that's not a problem. Now, we, have, we do have standard bodies and companies and academics that build instantiations, secure instantiations of diffie Hellman groups. And these are a few names that uh, um, gives us different um, diffie Hellman groups using elliptic curves that we believe to be secure. And some of you may, may recognize some of these names. We do have a realization of a secure public key encryption scheme based on um, diffie hellman groups. And this is an um, encryption scheme called EGAMAR that was proposed for the first time in 1985. And what is important here to note is that uh, we have a key generation algorithm that, as, as we were saying before, it has to be always probabilistic. And what we do is that we pick a generator for the group, and then we compute this generator, the exponentiation, the exponentiation of this generator to a certain integer that is random, and we call A. And then we publish as a public key G1 and G2, and um, we keep as a secret this exponent that we have uh, used to create G2. So we have a public key and a secret key. And now, in order to encrypt, we use, in this case, uh, because it will, be, it will become clear why we do this um, later on, we use a variant of the uh, Elgamal encryption scheme in which we are going to encrypt uh, messages that are integers, positive integers, but that are not too large. And uh, not too large in this case it would mean um, they can be uh, a maximum a few a few billions. That would be the, the upper bound of the for for the uh, messages that we can encrypt in, in this uh, in this encryption scheme. And what is important to note is that we choose a random uh, integer, and then we have two components in this ciphertext. G to the power r is the second the first component, and the second component is g two to the power r times g to the power. And these operations have sense in this, uh, in this um, diffie hellman group. So it's a uh, probabilistic encryption scheme. And then without having to get into the details on how we decrypt, but they, you can follow them in, the, in this slide, we have a process that allows us to decrypt by computing 
uh, first an exponentiation and then um, a, a div division in this group. And then from that element, we will search the message space and we will get the uh, original uh, plain text. So this is El Gamal. Now, I think there may be a question. No, no questions over here. Good. So please uh, ask any questions uh, if, if there is something that is not completely clear. <clears throat> okay, so we have presented this um, encryption scheme. Now, a property that this encryption scheme that is a very important property is that it's uh, malleable. One way in which this malleability uh, shows itself is because we can take uh, an encryption of a certain message M, an encryption of uh, uh, another message M prime, those messages could be completely different or they could be the same. And by taking those encryptions without knowing at all, which is a message that has been encrypted, we can compute uh, an encryption that contains the um, addition of the plain text, of the underlying plain text. And this is done by taking these two ciphertexts and computing the product of the, um, of the first component, and this is the new first component, and the product of the second components, and this is the, uh, the new second component. And you can do the math and you can see that um, that indeed gives us an encryption of the addition of two plain text. So this is this shows that this scheme is malleable because from a ciphertext or two ciphertexts, you can compute a, diff, a, a third ciphertext that is meaningfully related to the previous one. And this is a very useful property, as we will see, for, for instance, for voting. But this is not a property that you want to have in general for an encryption scheme. So then if, um, if we try to uh, sum up we what we have done until now, we have defined what a public encryption is. We have defined what secure public encryption uh, is, uh, or at least gi given a definition of it, indistinguishability of encryptions. Then we have shown a realization, a concrete instantiation of um, a public encryption scheme that we uh, conjecture to be secure. In this case, has indistinguishability of encryptions. And now we are seeing a property of that encryption scheme, that is malleability, that we sometimes want but in general, we don't want to have that property. So that means that uh, we need to find a way to uh, distinguish malleable schemes from non-malleable schemes. And there we, it comes a new property, which is very similar to the previous property of indistinguishability of encryptions, but in here, we give uh, a, bit of, a bit of extra help to the adversary. And what we do is that we allow the adversary to submit a ciphertext vector. So that means a vector of ciphertext. The adversary has only one shot at it. So can send only one such um, ciphertext vector. None of those components or the components of the ciphertext vector can be equal to the challenge ciphertext. So the ciphertext that contains the encryption of M beta. And then the adversary gets back the decryption of those um, ciphertexts that he um, included in the ciphertext vector. So this, by doing this, we are giving extra help to the adversary. And we still want that the adversary is unable to um, distinguish which uh, to guess correctly which uh, message we encrypted. If that is the case, then with this extra information, we uh, um, say that the uh, encryption scheme is not valid. OK. Um, in particular, that, then that means that this encryption scheme in here is um, doesn't fulfill that property because uh, by using this trick that we can compute from the encryption of two uh, ciphertexts, we can compute the addition of, of uh, uh, the encryption of the ad addition of two ciphertexts. What we can do is to take the challenge ciphertext, then compute an encryption of the plain text zero, then we uh, um, compute the uh, multiplication of those two ciphertexts, and we can send that as the uh, uh, 
one of the uh, ciphertexts in this uh, in the ciphertext vector, and they will, this will give us the um, as the answer will give us the uh, the 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 uh, plain text that was encrypted. At, that will break the security. Okay, so so far we have seen um, an example of a cryptographic primitive. We have seen two security definitions for uh, that um, uh, concrete cryptographic primitive, which is uh, public encryption. And we have seen um, a realization of that um, cryptographic primitive. Now we're going to see uh, to mention our first cryptographic method, and in this case, it's a hash function. This is something that has been already introduced in the in the uh, previous talk, so I will go very fast, very quick over this. A hash function is a function that takes uh, any string as an input, and what it does is to produce a fixed size output, and it's efficiently uh, computable, and it's difficult to compute uh, collisions of this function, meaning having two different inputs that uh, map to the same output, Though those collisions exist because we have a function that is, go, is mapping a very big set, big set to a, a much smaller set. So those collisions for sure exist uh, from an information theoretic point of view. But we are saying that they are difficult to, to find in uh, polynomial time. The uh, next cryptographic primitive that uh, we're going to see, or it could be a, a very basic example of a cryptographic protocol, is that of non-interactive proof systems. In non-interactive proof systems, what we have is that we have a language that can be uh, uh, compute uh, that is computable, meaning that uh, the elements uh, x in that in this case of this language have a witness, and we have a relationship that defines that lang language in the sense that X belongs to this uh, language, capital L, uh, if and only if the relationship uh, of X and W outputs one. And this, is, this uh, relationship is uh, something that is, you can compute uh, efficiently. Now, what we want to do is to compute proofs such that a prover who knows the witness for a certain um, element belonging to the um, uh, to the language, can convince a verifier that the statement uh, X belongs to the language is true, without revealing the witness. And that is what is called a uh, non-interactive system. Of course, it's trivial to see that uh, the statement is true if you reveal the witness, because then you just compute the uh, the uh, relationship R, and then you see whether it outputs one or zero, but we are not allowed to do that here. We are going to produce a proof that in principle is different from the witness. So if we are going to give an indirect um, proof of the fact that X belongs to the language, this means that we have to protect both uh, the prover who is proving that fact and the verifier who is verifying the fact. And um, the problems that we uh, uh, ask from uh, zero knowledge proofs, which because zero knowledge proofs protect both the uh, uh, prover and the verifier, are completeness, which means that if the uh, two uh, parties are honest, then the uh, protocol completes. And we, uh, uh, if we take uh, an element from the language, then we compute a proof, and that proof is uh, accepted by the verifier. And then we have a property called uh, soundness that protects the verifier because now the verifier is not going to see the witness. So we, the verifier wants that if the statement is false, then no cheating prover can convince the honest verifier that uh, the statement is true, except with negligible probability because we are in cryptography and we, we are dealing with uh, um, computationally bounded adversaries. And then there is this property called zero knowledge that protects the prover because the prover doesn't want to give out the witness to the uh, adversary. So what the prover wants is that uh, if the prover follows the protocol, so an honest prover uh, executing the protocol does not release any information about the secret witness other than the particular session that, that is true. 
So in zero knowledge proofs, we have completeness means that they work for honest parties. And then we have properties that uh, defend the protective verifier and protect the prover. Soundness protecting the verifier, zero knowledge protecting the prover. The way that you prove soundness is by um, exhibiting an algorithm that is called an structure. And the way that you prove zero knowledge is by exhibiting an algorithm that you call a simulator. We are not going to give more details about how zero knowledge proofs work because uh, the idea is that we are going to build from these uh, building blocks some protocols. Now, just to give you an example of the kind of the of the sort of um, statements that you can prove uh, with zero knowledge proofs. Um, here is a language. This language has um, an element of this language has four entries, and each entry is an element of a different element group. And what you have is that a uh, tuple of four elements uh, belongs to this language. If the um, third entry and is obtained by raising uh, the, the first entry to a certain exponent, and the fourth entry is obtained by raising the second entry to the same, exactly the same exponent, which is a witness. So here, a tuple of four uh, elements belongs to this language. If x1 and x2 are obtained by raising respectively g1 and g2 to the same exponent. And of course, this means equality of discrete logarithms because the discrete log of x1 with respect to g1 and the uh, discrete logarithm of x2 with respect to g2 are the same. And you can prove that in, uh, in zero knowledge with a non interactive proof system using a hash function. And um, I'm not get, going to get into the details of how that uh, works because that will take us um, uh, extra time. What is important to notice here again is that the uh, proving algorithm is probabilistic. And that's that's very important for the uh, zero knowledge, uh, zero knowledge property. Now, we can make Elgamal non malleable by adding to uh, the ciphertext a proof of knowledge of the um, randomness that has been used to um, compute the ciphertext. If we do that, and before decrypting, the receiver checks first the proof that is correct before decrypting. If we do that, then we obtain a non-malleable um, encryption scheme. So we go from an encryption scheme that has indistinguishability of encryption to an encryption scheme. That is normal. Um, no questions so far. Okay. So now we have seen examples of cryptography primitives, cryptography methods, how to define their respective uh, security properties, and now we move to the protocols. And uh, the first scenario is um, electronic voting. <clears throat> so in electronic voting, what we want to do is to be able to conduct an election, at least on election day, um, electronically. So first, what is an election? So an election has um, uh, several, consists of several uh, parts, several functionalities that are provided. First, we have an electoral register. And that's something that is outside the, um, uh, in the case of, of when we will see move, move into the, describing the protocol, this is outside the protocol. This is some, someone needs to uh, tell us who are the voters that can vote in our election. And that, that is the electoral register. And then the voters that are eligible to vote because they're in an electoral register, then they go to a police station, they uh, fill in a ballot, they put them into a ballot box, the ballot box is sealed, and then once the election uh, day is over, then the, um, some uh, 
some people that are, are authorized to do so do the counting. And finally, this um, results on um, an assignment of seats in a parliament. So that is what an election is. Now, it's important to note that an election is a process that is at the same time centralized but distributed. It's centralized because there are at least two of the functionalities of two of the elements of an election, the electoral register and the tally. So who is announcing, who has the um, capability and is allowed to uh, announce the election result, those are centralized. Those, there, is, there are single parties that, that do that. And decentralization will also appear when you, when you do the protocol. And, but there are elements that are distributed, which is the, the, the polling. Um, you will have different polling stations in the country run by different people and the voting process itself. So when you do on, online voting, um, because electronic voting, you could have uh, in-person voting by using electronic machines. Here we are dealing with the case of online voting in which we, you don't want the voters to, uh, to go to um, uh, a certain place where they will have access to a machine, a voter can vote with, um, let's say, um, uh, a mobile phone or a, or a computer or laptop. So the voter will enter the voter choices in a, in a machine, uh, let's say a computer, um, and this computer will do some cryptographic operations that will result in an encrypted ballot. And now this encrypted ballot travels to the internet and is stored in a digital ballot box. Uh, uh, and at the end of the election, then uh, the tally is done and the, the result is published in a, in a bulletin board. Now, why do you want to, uh, you may want to do um, electronic voting or online voting? Well, th there are uh, many reasons to do so, and we will touch upon them in, in, uh, in the slides that will follow next. But one uh, uh, very um, convincing reason is, for instance, there are uh, countries in which the uh, voting is just uh, too hard. So this is a real um, ballot um, from, a, uh, from Australia because they have this single transferable voting system which, in which you can express preferences. So this is very convenient to vote <coughs> and even less to, to count. Okay, so now we need to take uh, a look at what are the properties that we want to um, protect in here, what are, uh, uh, because now we are moving this uh, election process to a, a, a digital setting. So what are the things we want to protect? Well, of course we want to protect um, the choice of the voter. Now the voter is going to enter their choice into, into their voting device, so the voting device, um, we could accept that the voting device is going to let the, the choices of the voter, because the, the voter needs to enter them somewhere. But then uh, the ballot, the digital ballot, is going to get to a voting server and then to a counting server. And we would like to have privacy of the uh, uh, voter choice against the, um, the entities that are running these, uh, these services. And that, that makes a lot of sense. You want to protect the privacy of the voter, uh, at least against these uh, machines over here. And then you want to uh, protect the integrity of the voter choices and the integrity of the election. And uh, so normally we distinguish between two types of, uh, of uh, two phases of the voting process. The first phase in which the uh, the choices of the voter get transformed into a ballot and this ballot is stored in a voting server. That's the first phase. The second phase consists on counting the uh, tallying the, the election by opening those um, uh, digital uh, ballots. The first phase, we talk about individual verifiability. That is the security property that uh, wants to protect integrity, uh, captures protecting the integrity of the, of the vote of the voter in the first phase. The second phase is called um, universal verifiability.
Okay, so how do we define privacy for voting? So one could um, be tempted to say that a private, private uh, voting protocol shouldn't reveal how anyone voted. So that means, you know, it will be private because no one will know how anyone voted. And actually that, if we would like to define it like that, that would be too strong. No uh, voting process can ensure that because for instance, if we are counting the number of yes or no says in, an, um, in a referendum, if everyone votes, votes uh, uh, yes, and there are only three voters, then we know how everyone voted and uh, no matter which protocol we use. So that is, that will be, uh, that is too strong a definition for uh, vote privacy. We could follow um, very established uh, 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 approach to define uh, security in uh, cryptography, which is uh, to compare um, what an adversary can do uh, against our protocol in the real world to an ideal world in which this protocol is run by a trusted uh, third party. If the protocol is run by a trusted third party, then nothing can, can go wrong. So if we can show that it's very difficult to, uh, for an adversary to obtain an advantage over our cryptographic protocol uh, bigger than the advantage that this adversary could have against an, um, a protocol that is run by a trusted third party, then of course this means that our protocol is secure. Uh, the, um, the slight issue with this approach is that it's not a simple proof technique because it gives it, it gives rise to very complicated security definitions and that makes the uh, writing the security proofs also uh, complex and even more complex, very fine, but very fine by third parties, the, uh, the security. Since we are dealing with privacy, we could use an entropy-based approach. The idea will be that the uh, entropy of the uh, choices of the voter, once uh, um, we know uh, the, uh, we have the ballot box and the results of the election, is equal to the entropy of uh, the uh, voter choices once the uh, election result has been uh, announced. Remember that uh, the election result always um, leaks some information about the um, uh, about the uh, voters' choices, because in particular, if it's an unanimous election, we know how everyone voted. So this is, this is the idea that we could, we could uh, try to achieve. The problem, though, is that if we use uh, public cryptography, the en this entropy equals zero, because this uh, uh, digital ballot box uh, has security only against computation about the adversary. So in an information theoretic sense, this um, ballot box already reveals the, the voters' uh, choices. Um, so that is a problem because this is, this is always going to be zero. So we could not match this. A solution that has been followed in the literature is to define entropy against computational adversaries. And then in that case, we will be able to uh, achieve this goal and then uh, measure whether a, a given cryptographic protocol uh, achieves this property. Um, however, this is, um, even this is a useful uh, approach, this, the, uh, dealing with entropy is, is very difficult and is, 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 the, as a proof technique is even more complex than the previous one. So we are left with uh, following uh, an approach that is based on this distinguishability of, of encryption approach that we have seen for public encryption. And this is um, uh, the pattern that a um, uh, game-based security using indistinguishability, the indistinguishability approach follows for uh, defining um, ballot privacy. Um, so we have an adversary that uh, obtains the public key of the election and then the adversary can submit uh, the following queries. The adversary can make that uh, there are two uh, ballot boxes, then uh, he can choose uh, a vote for the uh, for a voter in the uh, left ballot box and a different vote for the same voter in the um, 
write ballot box. Then we will um, produce the ballot using the voting protocol, and then we will store uh, each um, uh, ballot in the corresponding ballot box. The adversary could also submit ballots on behalf of uh, voters that the adversary controls. So th those are ballots that maybe have not been produced by following the uh, uh, voting protocol. And when that happens, the same ballot is put on both the left and the right uh, ballot boxes. And the adversary can always, of course, read the contents of the ballot box. And then finally, the uh, adversary asks for uh, a tally of the election. Then on the other side, so we are the ones who are trying to check whether a given uh, voting protocol has privacy. So we are going to give the information to the adversary. We are going to provide the adversary with the public key. We are going to um, compute the uh, ballots and we are going to um, give the, uh, uh, we are going to answer the quiz of the adversary. And then we are going, we need to return a, a, a tally for that. How are, we going, how are we going to compute this tally? Um, we have different choices in here. What do we publish? Whether we restrict the adversary when uh, it's making uh, queries. And depending on how we uh, fill in these uh, question marks over here, then we get a different security uh, definition. So it's important to know that uh, privacy, we have had several uh, game-based uh, style definitions for privacy uh, in the last uh, 30 years or even more than 30 years. And uh, in a work that we um, uh, published uh, five years ago, we showed that all of those definitions have uh, problems. And now I just give you the uh, a definition that we have shown that is, is a good definition. What we do is that, remember that the adversary is producing here two uh, uh, ballot boxes, the left ballot box and the right ballot box. And the adversary is going to uh, be given a result for the election and the adversary needs to, to guess whether he was uh, uh, interacting with the left ballot box or the uh, right ballot box because the adversary can only see one. And um, what we do here is that we don't restrict the queries of the adversary. And then what we do is that we always, always publish the result of telling the left uh, ballot box and we simulate the uh, tallying proofs in the voting protocol by using a mechanism uh, uh, similar to what uh, the mechanism that uh, a simulator uses in zero knowledge proofs. If you remember when we saw uh, zero knowledge proof, we had this uh, property of zero knowledge precisely. And the way we prove zero knowledge is by showing the existence of a simulator. So some, here would be something similar. And this security definition is uh, captures value privacy for voting protocol. Okay. Now um, I'm going to show uh, a few canonical designs for voting protocols, and then we will move to uh, make the connection with uh, with blockchain. In order to do that, I need first to recall uh, a different um, public key uh, cryptographic uh, primitive called digital signatures. In digital signatures, what you have, uh, again, a public key that we call a verification key and a secret key that we call a signing key. Now, the uh, signer is going to publish this verification key in a repository next to their identity. And then they're going to use a sign algorithm that on input uh, a message that is normally hashed and their signing key outputs uh, a signature. And then there is a verification algorithm that on input the uh, a message and a signature and the uh, verification key output yes if the signature is correct or uh, no if the signature is not correct. This is the syntax of a digital signature scheme. A key generation algorithm, again, this is a probabilistic uh, algorithm that outputs the verification key and the signing key. The verification key is public, signing key is kept private. The signing algorithm could be probabilistic. And then we have the verification algorithm. Now, uh, of course, not every design of a, a signature algorithm is secure. So here is the, uh, uh, a, a diagram showing the definition of uh, security for a 
signature scheme, which is called affordability. And essentially what this definition is asking is that if, um, even if an adversary is able to see uh, signatures on different messages, if this adversary doesn't have the signing key, they are not able to produce a new signature on a different message. And that's what it means to be un uh, unfortunate. And uh, well, it's, it's, it's the intuitive definition, right? what it uh, makes sense of. Okay, so the first um, approach to do voting, which is um, an approach that we call total transparency, consists on every voter signing, signing with their um, uh, with a signature scheme uh, for which they have the corresponding uh, signing key, just signing their vote with no encryption. So the ballot box will consist of the uh, name of the voter, their vote for the election as a signature on the vote, and that for every voter. And then the, uh, in the tally phase, what the election authority will do is to check that um, uh, the signatures are correct. If the signatures are not correct, then the corresponding ballot is removed from the ballot box. And then uh, the votes are public, so they just tally the, uh, the election. If it's uh, just about adding the votes, then they will just add the votes. So this scheme is very good from a verifiability point of view, because there is no encryption. So everyone can verify. So it's very easy to protect the integrity of an election if you use this approach. But there is no privacy because the, obviously the, the votes are in the clear in the ballot box. Okay, so uh, a very simple, again, a very simple uh, voting scheme um, that uh, achieves maximum uh, verifiability properties is consists on publishing the vote and signing the corresponding vote by the corresponding voter using the corresponding signing key. Okay, well, let's change this a little bit by making the election authority to publish the uh, public key of um, an instantiation of the uh, non-malleable El Gamal scheme that we saw before. And then the voters will see this public key of the electoral authority, they will encrypt using non-malleable gamal their vote, and then they will sign the corresponding vote. So what we are doing is to add privacy to uh, some privacy to the previous uh, to the previous protocol. In the previous protocol we had the vote signed. Well here we are going to encrypt the vote with a public key that uh, uh, the corresponding secret key is only known by the election authority, so that is fine. And we just um, replace that vote that was in the clear with an encryption of that vote. And then in the tally phase, what the election authority does is to decrypt um, using the knowledge of the secret key, each ciphertext for which the corresponding signature is correct, and then they publish the result of the election. So this um, protocol indeed achieved privacy because the only thing that an adversary can see from honest voters are the uh, uh, encryption of their votes. This encryption is not malleable, so the adversary cannot change them into anything. And the election authority is just publishing the final results. So in, in, to some extent, if that encryption scheme is secure, then this um, protocol is not revealing anything about the, um, the individual's voter choices. The problem is that there is no verifiability because the uh, election authority is decrypting the ciphertext, but it's not giving any uh, proof that, that the encryption is correct or anything. So um, that is actually, um, these two examples show that there is that there is a tension between verifiability, protecting the integrity of this uh, election, and privacy. Because uh, the most simple, the simplest solution to achieve uh, verifiability to protect the integrity of the election doesn't provide privacy. And then the simplest uh, privacy um, um, solution for a voting scheme that has absolutely no verifiability. So one. 
way in which we can improve the verifiability of the uh, of the uh, voting protocol is by um, adding zero knowledge proofs that the vote is uh, the encryption is correct, and then the um, also making um, use of homomorphic encryption schemes in which the uh, encryptions of the different uh, voters will be will collapse into a single ciphertext that will contain the result of the election, uh, assuming that the result of the election consists of just uh, adding the votes of the of the voters, and then in the end the um, election authority is going to decrypt one single ciphertext that contains the uh, result of the uh, election, and it's going to prove using zero knowledge proofs that the uh, decryption is correct. So this version in which we have the encryption of the votes, zero knowledge proofs that those encryptions are correct in the sense that in, if it's a referendum, uh, um, for instance, then they either encrypt uh, uh, zero or one, zero for no, one for yes. So here there is uh, no way to cheat. And also then when uh, we collapse all the ciphertext into a single ciphertext, this is an operation that anyone can uh, verify. Then if the uh, opening of the ciphertext is also done using zero knowledge proofs, then no one can cheat. And then this gives uh, um, electronic voting protocol that, is, uh, uh, that achieves privacy. You can see here a diagram in how this could look in real life. You will vote for uh, 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 different candidates in the election by uh, adding uh, uh, a one on the corresponding vector entry of the ciphertext. And if you don't want to vote for a certain candidate, then you include uh, zeros. So in this case, this uh, first uh, ballot contains a vote for candidate A and a vote for candidate C, whilst the second uh, ballot contains a vote for candidate uh, one and a vote for candidate B. And in the end, you just add the columns, and this is what you have. Okay. Now, um, we have seen um, definitions of security for uh, cryptographic uh, primitives, for cryptographic methods, and then for cryptographic protocols, in this case, electronic voting. Now, are these definitions good enough for the reality? Do they capture the attacks that we want to defend uh, ourselves against those attacks? Or uh, maybe are we asking too much and then in the end, we, no one can provide a protocol that, um, um, that is secure, whereas uh, maybe if we would um, weaken those security definitions, we will see some uh, have protocols that meet those security definitions and meet the needs of the society. Well, it turns out that models and definitions are not uh, so uh, neutral. And this is something that uh, has been highlighted in the past by uh, two um, very well-known cryptographers in the different uh, IACR distinguished lectures. So in this case, uh, a lecture by me here, uh, Velar, where um, he discusses that uh, the, the way we defined uh, our security models is very much influenced by um, our, uh, our communities and the, the various tastes and, and judgments, and therefore different security models could be possible and all of them will be uh, valid depending on the community that you belong to. And um, also Philip Robertway uh, later did a, a, similar, um, a similar, similar claims. Now, in the case of voting, this is something that is uh, quite, um, quite obvious because um, First of all, why do you uh, want to use electronic voting? Well, uh, if you want voters to vote and you really uh, want to make their life easy, here is an extreme case of, uh, of Malta in which uh, in order to allow voters to vote for the uh, European elections, they uh, uh, had to uh, fly to Malta uh, 500 voters uh, costing uh, 800,000 euros. So that is, that is a extreme case, of course, but this is about making it convenient for voters to vote. You may want it because it's so uh, much faster to produce the result of the election. So in this case, under 15 minutes, because of course you are using uh, machines to do that. Uh, also to make it more convenient to vote with, uh, with to voters with disabilities. 
uh, also in your uh, own country, some uh, some researchers have claimed that um, voting machines uh, could uh, um, reduce uh, electoral fraud because it will be will make it more difficult for the fraud that is uh, that may be happening at the moment uh, in case you use uh, voting machines because the, the people will just not understand how they work. And then also uh, regarding how fast the uh, votes are uh, counted, uh, this can, this actually is uh, now um, in the US, they, they are flagging this as a potential problem because it could be that uh, the uh, mailing, the, the votes that will be sent by mail will favor uh, one of the other of the parties and uh, the uh, um, uh, vote could change from what is announced in the, uh, in, the, in the election night from what will be the final result of the election once those uh, uh, mailing uh, ballots are counted. So the main um, argument against electronic voting is that we'll be used to rig elections, but um, actually we see how elections are rigged today. Uh, the, the main way to do it is through uh, misinformation and uh, um, or propaganda gerrymandering in which you change the, uh, the, the borders of the electoral district so that uh, different uh, uh, votes for the party that you don't want to, uh, to win will not count um, anymore. And then is, there is voter suppression, so, um, which is also a very, uh, a very important issue, and especially <coughs> uh, in now because of, of, the, of, the, current, uh, of the current pandemic. So my take on electronic voting is that it helps uh, voter suppression and uh, even if you're very worried about uh, whether you can do it securely or not, uh, I think it's something that we, we deserve in the 21st century. Okay, that leaves me a couple of minutes to um, uh, move to the to uh, blockchain. So uh, I'm going to go quickly over this. So. Um, what is a blockchain? Well, a blockchain is a, a record keeping uh, mechanism in which you um, uh, list and store uh, transactions and it's a sequential list. And uh, these are examples of uh, uh, certain uh, transactions that you, will, you may want to um, store in a, in a ledger. And um, a blockchain is a um, protocol that allows uh, this record keeping mechanism to be um, to be uh, done by a collection of parties and that no central party is in charge of adding or uh, uh, records to this uh, to this ledger it's called blockchain because one of the most used uh, data structures to um, uh, to build these ledgers uh, it's, uh, it takes the form of a chain of blocks but it could be uh, it could be different things and then we have uh, another um, innovation in blockchain, which is uh, smart contracts. And these are um, uh, computational agreements between two or more parties that are going to be automatically executed once certain conditions are met. Lots of uh, different uh, uh, solutions to uh, blockchain currently. I'm not going to, um, I don't have time to cover this. Now, what are uh, blockchains good for? Essentially, to remove uh, um, intermediaries and, and to make possible that uh, strangers that do not trust each other can't interact. And um, and 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 it's for the reason that they can replace uh, mediators in a in a digital economy. These are a couple of of books that I can recommend if you want to learn about blockchain, but not about the technical aspect, but about what blockchains can be good for. And now. Um, Connections between e-voting and blockchain. If you see how uh, the the, uh, the main um, approach to build blockchains today consists on having transactions that uh, show uh, money uh, moving from one uh, public key address to another public key address, um, those transactions are those messages that establish how much money is moved from one address to the other address, and they are digitally signed. And that is precisely the same approach of the uh, total transparency um, canonical design for electronic voting. So there you see a very um, obvious um, connection. Um, 
and then as in electronic voting, once you want to add privacy to uh, that setting, whilst um, um, providing verifiability, then it gets very, it gets messy and it's difficult. And this is why also in blockchain, still this is not an, a, a, a problem that has been solved, although they have been um, very, um, very uh, powerful uh, advances in the last in the last few years um, using zero knowledge proofs, very <coughs> advanced zero knowledge proofs. And then the last, um, yeah, I think I'm going to uh, to stop here because um, I have uh, gone through um, the time that I was um, allowed to to speak. Okay. So the question is, voting device is verified through vote in blockchain. If untrusted devices are less than half, can we, uh, we can't identify these devices. Um, I haven't covered a particular uh, solution for voting using uh, um, blockchain. If we will use the um, canonical design where there is complete transparency um, in the in the blockchain. Then, um, if a device will change the vote of a voter, then the voter using a different device could check. That is the case because it will be in it will be in plain text. Uh, so it will be possible to do it, but the voter will need to use a different device that will uh, be used to verify that vote. Um, what is proof of work in blockchain? So that's a very interesting question. And in order to uh, answer that question, I will have need to, uh, uh, needed to um, introduce the problem of achieving consensus in a um, in a, um, in a distributed uh, network. And um, I can do it very quickly here. So if you want to maintain this ledger uh, using uh, a multitude of, uh, of a collection of parties, then they need to agree on which are the new transactions that are going to be added to the ledger. And um, the way this is done is normally the common approach is that you need to choose a leader in each round, and then this leader will propose which, which is the, uh, the next um, transaction list to be added to the ledger. Now, proof of work is a mechanism that allows you to choose that leader uh, at random by solving a cryptographic puzzle. And uh, the way this cryptographic puzzle works is that in order to solve it, you need to um, compute a number of, uh, of operations and you can, uh, and you can uh, define how difficult, uh, how many operations you need to run in order to solve that, uh, that puzzle. And the best way to solve that puzzle is to try uh, random um, inputs. And that's what proof of work gives you. Uh, the leader will be chosen because it will uh, choose, uh, it will solve this puzzle and everyone can verify that the leader uh, uh, solved that, that puzzle correctly. Okay, so uh, the other question is whether, uh, in which cases you will want to use a public or, or a private, private blockchain. Um, so I'm assuming in here that public blockchain means a permissionless blockchain and a private blockchain means a permission blockchain. So in a permission blockchain, only certain uh, users that normally are, um, authenticated by their uh, public keys are allowed to write into the ledger. Whereas in a permissionless uh, blockchain, anyone can do it. So um, 
maybe in the case of an election, because it's something that is very particular to, uh, to a country, uh, I would recommend using a, a, a permission blockchain, so a private blockchain. <coughs> um, whereas if you want to do uh, digital um, economy um, uh, actions, uh, systems that are going to run global or in a region, then probably a permissionless blockchain makes more sense. Question. No, my question is going on. If a block cancel because of them, what will happen? Um, so, if um, so, this puzzle needs to be solved in order to choose the next leader in the in the the next leader that is going to pro propose the next leap of, the, of transaction. So, you have uh, a ledger that is maintained using a blockchain, then. I solve the puzzle, then I, I um, create the list of transactions, and then I propose a block to the, to the network, and then the network will say, okay, yeah, you solve that part, the, the latest puzzle, and uh, then you're allowed to, we, we agree with you, and then we add this to, uh, to our local uh, blockchain. If no one is solving the next puzzle, then the, the, uh, uh, the ledger will stop. There will be no further transactions added, until a new puzzle is um, is solved, because uh, this um, collection of parties will not be able to agree on who is the next leader. So it seems. No further questions, so I'll leave the floor to the um, to Debasi. Stop share. Hello, uh, all the participants. Any question? I couldn't hear you well. Any question is there in that box? Ah, okay, yeah. Hello, sure. participant. Uh, from your end, any questions is there? Pem Kumar, hello. Hello, Pem Kumar. Yes, sir. Uh, any question is there? In the uh, from the audience, or from the participant. Uh, actually, uh, Galindo sir has already uh, been uh, answering the uh, answering okay. any session, sir. Okay, any, any any more question is there? They have put food in the chat box? No, for what? No, sir, till now not. Okay, okay. Galindo, sir, so, I think all the questions have been answered now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Galinda, for your valuable speech. That will be helpful to our participants, and that is very, very informative. So, from your busy schedule, uh, still, we are uh, able to join with us. Uh, so our hearty gratitude goes to you, and uh, your, uh, you have sh share your valuable knowledge on different type of research area, particularly on uh, that uh, blockchain technology and uh, e-voting. So thank you, th thank you, to, to, to Dr. Galinda. So uh, thank you, uh, thank you, thank, thank you, all the uh, participants. Uh, for, for for your patience and uh, for uh, attending the webinar and uh, uh, thank you to our honorable vice chancellor sir he has uh, suggested to uh, continue this webinar for the betterment of the students and uh, research community on the security and cyber security so uh, i also thankful to the our uh, webinar team webinar team uh, Mr. P.M. Kumar, he has done a lot of work uh, for uh, doing such type of, such type of, such type of uh, activities. So thank you all. Thank you. Uh, and uh, last but not, not not the least, thank you to thank you to the to um, the uh, today's eminent speakers, Dr. Galindo, then Dr. Lee, and uh, Dr. Alice. Thank you all. And uh, sure, we, we, sometimes later we can in future we can meet to you. Dr. Galindo, Dr. Alice, and uh, Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee has probably he has left. So thank you very much.
you're welcome okay thank you thank you thank you very much bye uh, bye sir alice ma'am is uh, still there thank you ma'am can you hear us ma'am oh she has left sir so, so we are at the end of the session sir and uh, we are now just uh, going for the links for the particip participants